woke up in shock to find my face covered in bandages. M my face! This can't be happening! Right, Callum? Tell me this is not happening! <laughs> Right after, the doctor entered the room. Miss, unfortunately, the glass from the car window has caused extensive trauma to your skin. As the doctor continued talking, I felt myself zone out and began to panic. My face is everything! Without it, my singing career is over! Ash, it's gonna be okay. I'll help you find a way to return to the stage. I promise. Hi, I'm Ashley, and I had a dream of becoming a famous singer. I used to sing on the streets to collect a few dimes. Then one day, a handsome and polite man approached me. I'm Callum, a talent scout, and I believe with your angelic voice and rare beauty, you have the makings of a star. It was love at first sight, and not only did I gain a manager, but also a hot boyfriend. He arranged for me to perform at cafes, bars, and restaurants. It was nonstop. I enjoyed it, but I have to admit I was also, uh, exhausted. And that's when Callum suggested that I use autotune and lip sync to save my throat. Babe, I know this ain't right, but you're burned out and I can't bear seeing that. You know, it's not forever. I think that way you can focus on dressing up and letting people admire that gorgeous face of yours. Hearing this did make me feel sad, but Callum knew what he was talking about, so I trusted him. While the fire inside me to perform on a professional stage still burned strong. Then one day, he told me some unexpected good news. No more small gigs. The famous company Dream M Entertainment is holding auditions to find their next big star. I've taken care of everything. You just need to be 100% confident in performing. This was it. My time to shine has finally come. But then that evening, while driving home and practicing singing, I had an uncontrollable coughing fit. I lost focus of the road for a split second and didn't see the incoming car until everything went dark. And the next thing I knew, I was waking up at the hospital looking like Frankenstein and certain that my big dreams were now in shatters. After two months in the hospital, most of my scratches healed, but only a deep cut scar remained on my cheek. Just a few days more until the audition, and I couldn't show up looking like this. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Can makeup cover it? Or maybe a mask? There must be something. But the doctor said I can't wear makeup until it's fully healed, as it might cause an infection. <laughs> and if I went on stage in a mask, people would certainly raise questions. Then Callum's eyes suddenly darted to the photo on the shelf. Ash, here's your answer. Get your sister to be your double until your wound heals. Y you mean Bridget? That freak? No way! Yeah, I do have a twin sister, but we aren't close, for sure. My parents divorced when we were seven, and the courts decided I'd live with dad and Bridget with mom. I had a great life with dad as he bought me any outfit I wanted. But Bridget was a tomboy and didn't care about fashion. The last time I saw her, she was wearing all faded clothes. I guess the whole moody, loner, frown-like-she's-constipated look was her vibe. I tried talking to her at college, but she always snubbed me. And just like that, we ended up being strangers, despite being siblings. And now you say I have to grovel her for help? No! I get that you guys aren't close, but surely you can put your differences aside for this once-in-a-lifetime chance at your dream? <sighs> I suppose Callum has a point. So I agreed. Only it wasn't that simple, as I didn't have Bridget's number and she refused to use social media. You know, to match her cool, unbothered vibe. Ugh. Hang on. I remember her scowling at me behind the counter at the Yo-Yo fast food once. Perhaps she still worked there? I immediately disguised myself and headed there. Oh, there she is. I started hovering around her and explained what had happened, then asked her if she'd be my double for the audition. But she didn't bother to care. Get out the way. I can't perform looking like this. Please, this is everything to me. It's none of my business. I have work to do. See, I can't just give up like this. So I ordered food and sat there and waited for her to change her mind. It was closing time already. I was about to leave when I saw Bridget and her boss quarreling with each other. My gosh, this is why it's never good to hire teenagers. I only hired you because you begged for the job. I I'm sorry, sir. I'll... <sighs> Darn it. Starting today, you will work without pay for three months. No, sir, I need money. You didn't even pay me last month. Hey, what are you doing? Go. You can work elsewhere. Don't be here with a scumbag. What? And you get lost before I report you to the cops. What you aiming at? Why do you have to work here anyway? Doesn't mom give you a big enough allowance? Don't pretend like you care. How could a spoiled girl like you ever understand? What do you mean by that? Ugh, 
Anyway, you need money, right? I can help you. Bridget didn't answer, but I saw through her a Miss Frosty persona. If you replace me until I'm recovered, then I'll pay you. A big check worth ten times what you're making here. By the way, only two of us and my manager know about this, so don't worry. Then I gave her my number and told her to message me when she made a decision. She reluctantly took it, saying nothing, and just left. But that evening, a message from an unknown number popped up. Okay, I'm in. You better pay me right. I immediately called Callum and told him the good news. Now it's time to turn Bridget into a temporary me. Normally, Callum and I keep our relationship low-key to maintain professionalism. And that's the same now. We're keeping it a secret with Bridget. Callum made it clear to Bridget that all she needed to do was to look pretty and lip sync. But geez, that girl could only moan. This crop is too tight and constricting. Stop scratching like a monkey. I showed her how to stand straight and walk like a diva. And it shocked me when she said she'd never heard of skincare. No wonder her skin was as dry as the Sahara Desert and her pores were as deep and large as black holes. No worries. The witches here will give you a magic transformation. Wow. She looked exactly like me, just without the wound. (sighs) Even Callum was impressed. He instantly offered to help her into the car and drive her to the audition. Mm, I guess it made sense for Callum to keep her on our side. Now is not the time for stupid jealousy, Ashley. I disguised myself as Bridget's assistant and nervously waited backstage. The audition was such a nightmare. Bridget's lip syncing didn't match the pre-recorded audio, and she danced like she had two left feet. Finally, the performance ended, and the first judge to comment was David Knight, a.k.a. the music wizard, master composer, and lord of melodies. Oh, I know this guy. He's sure a demigod in real life. Your singing was dismal, and your dancing was catastrophic. Did you get lost looking for the bathroom and wander on stage by accident? Having a pretty face isn't enough to keep you here. The judge sitting next to David suddenly grabbed the mic. Wait, he's the CEO of Dream M. <clears throat> Uh, you're wrong, David. Beauty is also talent. She's a diamond in the rough and only needs a little polishing to shine. After the show, Callum was overjoyed as he informed Bridget that she'd become a talent at Dream M and would soon become an A-lister. I was so excited, too, that I flung my arms around Bridget, but she coldly pushed me away. Enough for today. Since then, the three of us agreed that Bridget would perform on stage while I would record at the studio. The bad side was about putting up with David, the difficult judge at the audition who was in charge of my recording session. The only thing going for you is your face, so why hide it behind that mask? If you must know, I didn't have time to apply any makeup. Satisfied much? Sorry, what you say? It was too early in the day to deal with such a jerk, so I stayed silent and focused on the session. Hmm... Your singing has improved significantly since the audition. It just still lacks some emotion. <laughs> thanks. My debut was just days away, but things didn't go so well. Bridget had no sense of style and appeared in the fashion column Worst Dress Lists, shaking like a leaf on stage and jumbling her words when facing impromptu interviews. So I had to set up a crash course for Bridget, but this time I taught her simple, easy-to-remember things instead of big stuff like last time. I showed her how to pair basic outfits, how to deal with the press, and most importantly, I still guaranteed her regular pay. Ash, you, um... You've helped me a lot, and I, anyway, so, uh, thanks. Oh my, she was so awkward, but that was sweet. I could gradually feel that we were actually sisters. Bridget, the main effort was still yours. Keep it up. Soon, the company began to promote Bridget, and her reputation skyrocketed. All the while, my relationship with Callum took a nosedive. At previous events, Callum used to pamper me and bring me my favorite foods. But now, he just brought Bridget's favorites. He never left her side, and they were always having cozy chats. So one day, I decided to talk straight to him about this. Callum, I have to admit that I feel kind of uncomfortable, as you're a bit too close to Bridget. Babe, I got you. I have to pretend I'm with Bridget as everyone thinks she's you. I'm doing this for your own good, so stop overthinking. Will you do it for me? I know, but I really feel insecure since I got this scar. It's like I've lost everything. Don't worry, the scar will eventually heal. The most important thing right now is you stay calm and get through this time. Ah, right. I suddenly forgot that I was working for a greater goal. 
I tried convincing myself that they were just dedicated to their work and that my wound would be healed soon and I could go back to being me. I still go to the hospital every week for follow-up and treatment. It's faded, hasn't it? I needed to escape, so I went to the studio to sing my heart out. I was certain no one would be there at this time of night, but turned out I was wrong. Surprisingly, on seeing me, that dude didn't shoo me away. Instead, he was actually pleasant. A night owl too, huh? Start singing then. I'll give you my valuable opinions. I was shocked by this approachability, but I rolled with it. David was many things, but there was no denying he was extraordinarily talented that made huge hits. I sing, and he gave me some useful tips and pointers. I believed you'd be too haughty to listen to my guidance, but it turns out I was mistaken. Well, I found you annoying at first, but I appreciate your help and I value your feedback. It seems there's actually a nice guy behind the ogre front. S sorry, what you say? I won't say it twice. Then I started humming a few lines from a song I'd written, but didn't realize I was singing it out loud until it was too late. That song is good. Whose is it? Uh, actually, I wrote it. No need to be mocking. No, I'm not at all. I didn't know you had a talent for songwriting. Come here. Let me hear the whole song. So we sat down together, and surprisingly, our vibe matched each other perfectly. Actually, you're the first person to take my ability seriously. Sorry? Hey, stop pretending! Actually, I'm not pre- Gradually, Bridget seemed to figure out how to act like me, and her popularity grew. She was no longer sluggish and paid more attention to her appearance. Even Callum mentioned how he could only distinguish us by my wound. From then on, Callum said Bridget could do it herself, so they went to the shows without me. This feeling is making me squirm. On the one hand, I want Bridget to do well to help me out. On the other hand, I'm also feeling a bit resentful that I was replaced so easily. I also miss the way Callum used to care about me. But I remember what he said the other day, and I know I shouldn't be acting like a child. So I tried to distract myself by doing what I love the most, singing. Everybody was packed with Bridget's show, so this world is mine. Woohoo! I was in the studio practicing my new song when suddenly David barged in. Can you explain to me why you're here whilst also performing on TV live? W why are you here? Does it even matter now? Who really are you? I begged him to keep quiet. Then I frantically took my mask off and told him everything. I mean, everything. As I was too shocked to make any excuses. This is insane. I know it isn't right, but, but I, I promised once my wound healed, everything would go back to normal. Singing is everything to me. David remained silent for a while, then blurted out, All right, if what you said is true, I will keep your secret. And one more thing, if you really like singing and songwriting, I can continue to help you. What do you say? Y yes, yes, totally, yes. And don't you dare lie to me. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Yeah, swear to God. Finally, it was the follow-up day. As the doctor finished the examination, I saw him frown. I'm sorry to inform you that the scar cuts too deep. It may fade over time, but I'm afraid it won't go completely. At least in two years. I broke down. This couldn't be happening. <laughs> Not knowing what else to do, I decided to go and find Callum. But when I arrived at his house, I saw that he wasn't alone. Bridget and Callum were sitting together and slowly... Leaning for a kiss. So, here I am, practicing this tricky pose. I must not fall over. Rosie, straighten your back. Hang in there. You've got this. That's Bradley, my yoga instructor. Can you see that? There are more than a dozen people in this class, yet he only seems to encourage me. Did this mean he liked me? I didn't need to look in a mirror to know my cheeks were lobster red right now. I'm Rosie, by the way. 18 years old. I'm still single. Not to brag, but I know I'm kind of pretty, friendly, and fun to be around. So it's easy to tell that many guys are into me. But why do none of them ever dare to confess their feelings to me? Hmm, what were they so afraid of? Take Bradley, for instance. He clearly liked me, but was too shy to admit it. It was so obvious, as he kept deterring past my mat just so he could check out my position. Even my best friend Joseph noticed that, as every time Bradley approached, Joseph would have this cheeky smirk on and send me signals with his eyes. I already told him not to do that. After class, Joseph kept teasing me about it. He told me Bradley definitely had feelings for me and just needed one more push for leverage. 
Although I reluctantly told him to stop, he insisted on being the wingman by texting Bradley about me. Bradley, why don't you ask Rosie out? You two look really cute together. Come on, you know that wouldn't work. Huh? <laughs> why not? Because, Joseph, it's you I'm crazy about. I was not okay. What was the problem with all the men around me? Why didn't they like me? I couldn't go on like this. I must have a boyfriend. And I was dead serious about it. So after researching online, I found a dating coach to save me from my tragic single situation. So Martin, my coach, is super handsome, has a six pack, and his business is a big hit. He's helped hundreds of sad single people find love. Flashy enough to trust, isn't it? Still, I was quite nervous when I met him. You know, the feeling that a therapist would judge you before treating you. But actually, he was reassuring, very open, and didn't ask too many questions. Let's just be open about this, all right? Manipulating someone into dating you is not the foundation to a healthy relationship. But don't worry, as I have the secret. Day one. And according to Martin, I needed to learn how to approach new people. I'm pretty shy, so taking the initiative was hard for me. But Martin taught me a trick. When I see a cute guy, I need to approach him within three seconds. This way my brain wouldn't have time to think, analyze, then talk myself out of it, and end up missing my chance. Okay, a hot guy was there staring at his phone. I must not overthink. One, two, three, go. Hi! Hi? Um, so I just saw you, and I think you're really hot. I'm here to say hi. Thanks for thinking my boyfriend's hot, but he's taken. I panicked then rushed back to Martin and spluttered out, I, I, I can't. Hey, that was a success. You're just training your mind and body to take action. Go ahead. No way. Should we move to the next step? And this was the next step. I just needed to start a conversation in this place where everyone was in a mood to have a chat. It's simple, Rosie. Put yourself in a talkative mood. Go over to them and give them a compliment. But make sure it's genuine, else it won't count, okay? Got it. I spotted a man sitting alone, so I walked over to him. Hey, I like your... ring. O-M-G. Was that a wedding ring? <laughs> don't, don't worry. I'm single. And is it that hard to think of something to compliment me on? <laughs> and, um, you are smarter than you look. And yep... He left. Oh, what kind of compliment was that? Martin sat in a corner and watched me go from guy to guy and stutter out a string of terrible compliments. You did great, Rosie. Don't be discouraged. Now, when you actually see someone you like, you'll be more natural. Martin said that body language is a crucial part of keeping the conversation going. So, the plan was to practice this at Joseph's birthday party. This time, Martin couldn't be there in person, but we still stayed in touch via my Bluetooth earphone so he could guide me. The mission today was to initiate physical contact with someone and make them feel close to me. Anyone who knows me knows that I am not good with these things. So I kept giving them this weird slap on the back. Hey, I heard an ouch. Are you hitting them? I said just a light tap. I don't think I can do this. I'm too shy. And now guys are giving me weird looks. Martin said this time I should make the boys take the initiative, and then things would come more naturally. Okay, I'll give it one last try. This boy I like, Nathan, is over by the pool, but he's in a group. Nothing to worry about. You'll make him come to you. Now listen and follow. I walked over to the bar and made sure I was in Nathan's eyesight, sat as naturally as possible, made eye contact with him, and smiled. Oh! Martin, this is stupid. He doesn't even know me. Just wait. OMG. He's waving at me. Should I come now? No, no, no. Wave him over. Okay. You should take responsibility for this, Martin. I waved Nathan over. Then, to my surprise, he got up and started walking toward me. OMG, help. What should I do? Give a no-tooth smile. Then say, I just want to say hi. What? That was all? But he was coming closer and I had no choice. I just want to say hi. And I want to have your phone number, cutie. I couldn't believe it. That was a real success. We texted the whole night. We got on so well. He was clearly flirting with me. This is crazy. 
But then two weeks passed by and I didn't hear from him at all. I kept on looking at my phone, expecting Nathan to call, but he never did. So I immediately rang my coach for help. Ready for the bad news? So, that means he doesn't like you. A busy man like Napoleon could still write thousands of romantic love letters to his Josephine. If he was into you, he'd always find a way. And I also think he doesn't seem like a good type to date. What? Nathan is such a sweet guy. Maybe he's just super busy? But then Christmas came, and I couldn't wait any longer. I mustered up the courage to ask Nathan out. But guess what? He invited me to his house to enjoy Christmas with his family instead. Oh, wow. He wanted to introduce me to his family. This was massive. It meant he really took our relationship seriously, didn't he? But when we got to Nathan's place, to my surprise, it was just a small apartment and definitely not big enough for a whole family. Seeing my confused look, Nathan said his family must have changed their plans and went out, which was for the better as the two of us would have more time together. Suddenly, I saw a shadow of a girl in a red dress in his bedroom. Then Nathan immediately pulled me away and said, Uh, um, that's my maid. How annoying. So, do you want to go to the hotel so we can have more time alone? Really? Did he think I was born yesterday? I refused immediately, and Nathan began to change his attitude. <laughs> okay, but I can't drive you home. I have something urgent. But don't worry, I'll take you to the nearby bus stop. I have never felt so stupid. Martin was right. Nathan wasn't serious about me. He just wanted to use me. But what went wrong? I did everything I could, but I kept failing again and again. No one liked me. I called Martin in tears, and he ended up driving there to pick me up right on Christmas Eve. I felt like the most tragic person ever. Martin was so patient. He turned the radio on so loud and didn't say anything until I finished crying and calmed down. Misread the signals again, huh? How could I have known? Well, I'm not saying this to make money off you, but looking at the current situation, I think you need to hire me for longer than you think. My love life may have sucked, but at least I had Martin. Here's my hope. He was the best coach ever, as he didn't mind answering my questions, and he always picked up the phone whether it was office hours or midnight. Then one night I was out with my friends. I drank a few too many wines and phoned Martin up and slurred out a load of drunken nonsense. He immediately came to pick me up and drove me home, saying that he needed to make sure I got home safely. He was such a sweet guy. I felt something, but then reassured myself that he was just being nice. But Joseph insisted that Martin was only acting this way because he liked me. Seeing everything he did, and you still have to wonder about his feelings? Dummy. Believe me, I'm not wrong this time. Mr. Sixpack is crazy about you. Congrats. Hmm. Thinking about it, it did make sense. So I started stalking my coach on social media and daydreaming about him. Then, taking Martin's own advice that I needed to make my feelings known. So, on Valentine's night, I, myself, made this box of chocolates and took them round to his. I took a deep breath, then rang the doorbell. But then, standing at the door was him holding hands with another girl. I awkwardly said, Don't, don't you like me? I mean, you taught me that when a guy likes a girl, he'll always be there for her. You picked me up in the middle of the night, and you always listened and comforted me when I was sad. You even brought me hot tea when my Aunt Flo came to visit. Doesn't everything match up? R Rosie... I was just being nice. Sorry, but you've confused the signs. Again. I was totally dumbfounded. I couldn't face the thought of seeing Martin ever again, so I blocked him from my life. Ugh. In the following days, I was under a variety of emotional states. From extreme stress, heartbreak, embarrassment, then disappointment because of my extra delusion. I struggled with insomnia almost every night, and tried to bury my feelings by binge-eating junk food. Just two weeks later, I looked at myself in the mirror. There were dark circles under my eyes, my skin was dry and flaky, and I felt bloated and sluggish most of the time. Seeing myself like that reminded me of something Martin had said. How can you expect someone else to love you if you don't love yourself? I knew I needed to change, so I started eating more healthily, 
working out, and finding me time. And you know what? It worked. Now I can finally say that I see my own worth, and I'll never allow a man to treat me badly ever again. And if that means I stay single for a while, then that's the way it'll be. I guess I kinda owe Martin a lot. I mean, he did teach me loads. And now, even though I'm still single, I'm enjoying it. There are way more important things than having a boyfriend, right? But wait, was this barista winking at me? OMG, there's a post-it with his number on my coffee cup. What should I do? Hey, dating a coffee guy is risky business. Why, coach? Imagine one day your relationship turns bad and you desire a cup of coffee to ease your heart out, but you also have to see him here. Awkward, huh? Indeed a pro. But so why are you making this awkward convo? <laughs> Rosie, I may be a love coach, but even I get it wrong sometimes. When it comes to my heart, all theories are nonsense. Please, you show me how to love naturally. Um, well, as you can see, I'm dating my dating coach. But now, our love doesn't apply to any cliches. Instead, we just do us, and we're both happier than ever. If you're in a dating slump, then don't worry. Just let love happen when it happens, and follow you. I'd just climbed back into the room when suddenly I heard a voice. Jasmine, how come you're only getting home now? I turned around to find Emma standing there. That's my business. Don't come home late like this again. Okay? You'll be grounded if your dad finds out. I shrugged and closed my door without saying anything. Yep, that's Emma, my stepmom. She doesn't actually care, she just pretends to. If it wasn't for her telling my dad to forbid me from singing, then I wouldn't have to sneak out to go practice like this. Different day, same story. Yet again, I've had to lie about going to my singing practice. Honestly, I can't wait to be an adult so I can do whatever I want. Dad, I'm going over to Mix to study, I said as I headed for the door. Suddenly, Emma pulled me back and handed me a bottle. Huh? Licorice tea? Drink this after practicing. It helps keep your voice clear. Then she winked at me. Huh? So she knew I'd lied about where I was going, yet still she'd helped me? Maybe, just maybe. I've been misunderstanding her this whole time. Later that night, Emma suggested we should go for a picnic on the weekend, and for once, I excitedly agreed. But when the weekend rolled around, there was this hectic snowstorm. Ugh. Emma kept looking out at the snow, with disappointment written across her face. Ugh. That's when the idea hit me. How about we have an indoor picnic? Yes, that's right. That's a great idea. And so, we set up the tent right in our living room, and we were having the best time, when suddenly, the doorbell rang. I got up to answer it, and standing there, covered in snow, was a woman. She suddenly ran at me and said, Oh my gosh, Jasmine, you've grown up so fast! I've missed you so much! Before I could understand what was going on, Dad shouted, Megan, I can't believe you have the nerve to show up here like this! I know you won't accept my apology, but you don't understand. I had to see her. I've missed her every single day. Oh my god. So, that woman was my mother? I couldn't hold back my tears and ran straight over to hug her. I swear I had been waiting for this moment for years. Mom gently stroked my hair and then turned to my dad. Can I stay here for a while? Just... To make it up to my beloved daughter after such a long time being apart, Elvis. Are you joking? Get out of my house. Dad, please let her stay. Please. But no matter how much I begged, Dad wouldn't give in. And so I turned to Emma for help. Elvis, just let her stay here. If Jasmine wants to be with her mom this badly, we should let them have some time together. Come on, darling. I looked at Emma with so much appreciation, then turned those puppy eyes towards my dad, and eventually he reluctantly nodded his head. Yay! I shouted and led mom to my room. From that day onwards, I spent most of my free time with her. We went to the movies together, shopping together, and honestly, it was the happiest I'd ever felt. One day, I was listening and humming along to my music when mom came in. Wow. 
So, you also love singing? It must be genetic. Back then, if I hadn't been so passionately obsessed with music, which drove your dad crazy, I might never have left you like that. Now I regret it so much, Jasmine. I put my arms around her and softly said, After all these years, I still think about that lullaby. Can you sing it to me? Which one? I sang you many lullabies back then. It's Don't Know Why by Nora Jones. Oh, right. That one. Then she started singing. I swear to God, her voice was like an angel. But strangely, it didn't give me any of the feelings I had as a kid. Was it because I have grown up? While I was absorbed in my thoughts, I suddenly saw Emma's shadow at my doorway. But when she met my eyes, she hurried down the stairs. Huh? Why was Emma crying? I was so confused. She must be jealous of our relationship, Mom said. Yeah, probably, since she'd been married to my dad for three years, but we'd never been close. That evening, when I went to the kitchen with Mom to set the table, she suddenly shouted, Oh my gosh! Why did Emma make chicken parmigiana? Doesn't she know that your dad hates this? Then she took the plate and threw it in the trash, saying she would order takeaway instead. Huh? Dad hates this? He always complimented Emma on her signature dish. Before I could react, Emma entered the room. As soon as she saw her chicken in the trash, she glared at Mom. Things then got so awkward. Emma had skipped dinner. Mom also tried to start a conversation with Dad a few times, but he ignored her. Ugh, I felt so bad for Mom. In my dad's eyes, there was only Emma now. But my mother had done nothing wrong. She just wanted to pursue her passion. Later that night, I was heading to the pantry to get some snacks when I heard Emma yelling at Mom. Megan, for old time's sake, I didn't bring up anything from the past, but you can't just do whatever you want. How dare Emma yell at my mom like that? As soon as Emma left, I ran over to my mom asking her what had happened. She hesitated for a while, then told me the whole story. It turned out Mom and Emma used to be in the same band when they were young. And since Mom was always the lead singer, Emma had begrudged her ever since. Perhaps she has never gotten over it. Ugh, I didn't expect Emma to be so mean. So from that day on, I began to show my attitude towards Emma. I didn't let her go to the parent-teacher conference like I had promised before. And I even forbade Mick, my best friend, from talking to her every time he came over. Mom, how did you and Dad meet back in the day? Well... Back then, your dad was a waiter at the lounge I used to sing at every weekend. We quickly fell in love and started leaving love letters for each other at our secret spot. Ew, how cheesy. It's called romantic, you silly. At that time, we put our initials at the end of every letter. Suddenly, there was some noise at the door, and I turned to see dad standing right behind us. What do you mean, our initials? It represented our two favorite characters' names from that movie. Yes. It was the initials of Monica and Quincy in the movie Love and Basketball. Dad gaped at Emma in surprise as she continued. I was the one writing letters to you that year. But when I got to the meeting spot, I saw you and Megan together. So I left. Dad and Emma looked at each other, then turned to stare at Mom. Actually, back then I liked you so much that I pretended to be Emma. But it's not that important. In the end, you were still into me and we got along really well, right? I can't believe you lied to me like this for all these years. Then dad angrily left the room followed by Emma. As for mom, she was sitting there, tears pouring from her eyes. Okay, so mom was definitely in the wrong. But did dad need to treat her like that? Who doesn't make mistakes from time to time? And anyway, it's because of my mom's mistake that I'm even here, right? From that day onwards, the atmosphere in the house was so intense. Dad ignored mom, and Emma always gave mom hateful looks. Until one day. I'd just gotten home from school when I saw my dad excitedly running towards me saying, Emma is pregnant. You're going to have a little brother or sister. Wow. I'd always wanted to have a sibling. I couldn't believe it. So that night, my family threw a party to celebrate. And mom also congratulated dad and Emma. And thanks to that, the tension between the three of them started to ease. Phew. But a few days later, for some reason, Dad found out that I'd lied about going studying with Mick. He was furious and grounded me for a week. I was sullenly playing on my iPad when Mom entered the room. Emma must be the snitch. Now that she's pregnant, she wants Dad to be angry with you, 
so he'll give all his love to her and the baby. Well, that just made sense. The other day, I'd even seen Emma whispering something to Dad, and as soon as he heard it, he got mad. Ugh, such a two-faced woman. I had to sort this out, and so I set up a fun plan for my stepmom. One time, I made her orange juice using powdered cheese, and she ended up spitting it out all over Dad. (laughs) Then I unscrewed the shower head to add blue food coloring, and that's how I gave her a Smurf makeover. It was hilarious hearing her horrid scream from the bathroom. Another time, I snuck into Emma's room, trying to put flour in her hair dryer. I was rummaging through the bedside table looking for her hair dryer, when suddenly I saw a DVD labeled Jasmine 0311. Huh? What's this? Why was my name on it? Curious, I went back to my room to play it, and then I couldn't believe my eyes. On the screen, Emma was carrying a baby and singing a lullaby to her. This melody. Wasn't it the song Don't Know Why? So that baby was me? But Emma couldn't sing. Could she? Her voice was weak and sounded hoarse. What did this mean? I rushed to show my dad the DVD. Emma told me not to talk about this, but since you already know, I won't hide it anymore. Then he told me everything. Turns out my mom left for a rich man when I was only two years old and it was Emma who came and helped my dad take care of me during my younger years. Oh my gosh. What? So all those memories of my mom's warm hugs and lullabies were all actually of Emma? A feeling of guilt welled up in my heart. I had to do something to apologize to Emma. So the next day, I asked Mick to go to the mall to help me buy her a gift. As I was passing a coffee shop, I suddenly saw my mom sitting with some guy. Without thinking much, I quickly pulled Mick to a nearby table and eavesdropped on them. Honey, how's the money? You know how pushy the creditors are, and they're getting kinda aggressive. Don't worry, it won't be long now. My daughter's on my side. She'll help me kick her stupid stepmom out. Then my ex-husband will soon follow her wish and volunteer to give me money. What? What was going on? Had mom come back just for dad's money? I was about to go confront her when my phone rang. It was dad. Jasmine, go to the hospital right away. Emma is in the emergency room. By the time I got there, I saw my dad sitting outside the ER with his head in his hands. After a while, the doctor came out and said, Both mother and baby are okay. Next time, please pay more attention to the patient's food allergy. How could you eat stuff you're allergic to? You must be more careful, okay? Yeah, Emma always took good care. It didn't make sense. Unless... my mom... I was about to tell dad about what I'd seen at the mall when mom suddenly appeared, eagerly asking about Emma's situation. Unable to stand her pretense any longer, I shouted, Mom, drop the act. It was you who did all of this, wasn't it? Jasmine, what nonsense are you uttering? Furious, I immediately told them the whole story I've heard. Megan, I could forgive you for the old letter story and for trying to sabotage my voice. But the fact that you wanted to harm my baby is unforgivable. It turns out the stuff from the past that she mentioned before was that my mom harmed her to destroy her voice. So that's why dad didn't let me sing, for fear that it would cause Emma pain. Suddenly mom burst out laughing. (laughs) I don't need your pity. You were so lucky to have such a beautiful voice and a wonderful man by your side. And even now, you're still trying to take the life that should have been mine. Megan, give it up already. You need to stop this. Mom was about to say something, but I interrupted her. Mom, please just go. I'm so ashamed to have a mother like you. Then I burst into tears. She got up and left, without even so much as a glance back at us. Emma took me into her arms. I was afraid that you would be disappointed. That's why I hid everything from you. I'm sorry for treating you so badly. She gently patted my head, and I felt like I was back in my childhood, where she'd held me and sang lullabies. It was so comforting. Finally, peace has returned to my family. I'm so fortunate to have Emma as a stepmom. And pretty soon, my little bro or sis will be here. And I can't wait. Hey guys, I'm Feather, and I look just like any other 16-year-old, right? Actually, my life as a teenager is far from ordinary since I have hemophilia. 
a rare disease in which my blood doesn't clot properly, so even a simple graze could be fatal. My parents are so worried that I might hurt myself that they keep me safely shut away in this mansion. In fact, I've never left it. Money isn't a problem to them as they own this massive energy corporation, so to compensate for me not being able to go outside, they make sure I get anything I ask for. My giant playroom is cool, right? Not only that, but I also own a dressing room with hundreds of cute Lolita outfits and an enormous pantry full of my favorite snacks that I can enjoy at any time. You see, there's honestly nothing to complain about, except I suppose it does get a bit lonely sometimes. Until one morning, I was woken up by a screeching noise coming from downstairs. Are you kidding me? Do you want to burn my throat with this or what? What's going on here? I went over to the living room and was stunned to see a girl sitting way too comfortably on our couch. I was still trying to figure out who she was when she suddenly said, You, standing at the door, get me another glass of cool water. Now. Taken aback, I instinctively went to get her water. Then the girl finally looked up and seemed startled to see me. Oh my, I'm terribly sorry. I thought you were just one of the maids. Turns out she's Katie, the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Forger, the two scientists that are collaborating with our family's corporation. My parents arranged for them to stay here to facilitate the research on the upcoming project. When I told her about my life and condition, she seemed really surprised. Oh, Feather, it's as if you live in your own tiny world. There are already flying cars out there, and they've just invented time machines too. You're missing out on so much. Really? How come no one told me about this? <laughs> I'm just joking, silly. Whoa, you weren't kidding about not leaving this place, were you? Then she started telling me about some of her favorite things to do in the outside world, such as watching the latest movies in the cinema, going to the mall where she could actually try things on before buying them, or attending all the fun festivals. It all sounds so cool. We chatted for ages, then I showed Katie around the mansion. Her reaction when seeing my dressing room and the playroom was seriously priceless. <laughs> From then on, I spent lots of time with Katie, but my favorite part about being around her were her stories about school, where she got to learn new things and make a lot of friends. Seeing my excited expression, Katie immediately suggested that I talk to my parents about maybe letting me experience it myself. Actually, it doesn't hurt to try, right? So at dinner, I gathered my courage to say, Mom, Dad, I want to go to school. I understand that you're worried for me, so Katie will come along to protect me. Right, Katie? Oh, yes, that's right. Feather is in good hands, Mr. and Mrs. Adams. My parents seemed very hesitant, but after a whole lot of persuading, they finally agreed with conditions. We'll join the most prestigious school in the state and have our own chauffeur. As for Katie, to avoid any incidents occurring, I suggest you get rid of the long nails and jewelry, Katie. We went back to my room after dinner, and I just couldn't hide my excitement. Yes, we'll get to go to school together soon. What should I prepare? What would you recommend? But then I noticed Katie staring in sorrow at her newly done set of nails. I'm so sorry, Katie. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? It's okay, Feather. What matters is that you're able to go to school, and I'm so happy for you. It's bedtime anyways. I'll head back to my room now. I'm so lucky to have a friend like her. As I was indulging in my thoughts, a familiar voice startled me. Hey, I heard you two are going to school. Are you sure it's safe? Katie doesn't seem all that trustworthy. That is none of your business. You're just jealous that I've made a new friend while you're still lonely, aren't you? In case you're wondering, this guy is Liam, the butler's son. He was my childhood best friend and used to come to the mansion every day for homeschooling and to spend time with me. But we had some petty argument and I hadn't seen him since. Well, at least not until now. He was about to ramble about something else, but I slammed the door in his face. I wasn't going to let him ruin my mood. What I need to think about is my school day that's coming up. Oh my, it's so exciting. I really can't wait. Ah, we are going to Edgewood High today. So I decided to wear my favorite Lolita dress as Katie suggested. Oh, I almost forgot, Mr. Freddy. He's been my best friend since childhood, and of course he had to come along with me on this big day. Katie also said I should try introducing him to everyone. That would help me make new friends faster. Such a brilliant idea. Whoa, we're finally here. Hey, Katie, how do we find our lockers? Hey, Katie, when is lunch? Hey, Katie, do you know who's going to teach us? Oh my god, Feather, stop asking. Everyone's staring. Uh, I didn't even notice. It's probably because we're new. Hi, I'm Feather. Or maybe it's because of your extravagant outfit. Before I could say anything, someone spoke up. That's a lovely dress. 
Oh, you're right, they do seem to like my dress. <laughs> I waited for everyone in the room to settle, then confidently introduced myself. Hi everyone, I'm Feather, and this is my best friend, Mr. Freddy. As soon as they saw Mr. Freddy, everyone burst out laughing. I didn't know what was so funny, so I just awkwardly laughed along. After class, I asked Katie why our classmates laughed earlier, and what she told me was unbelievable. They were making fun of me. It's so sad to know, but I guess not everyone can be as nice as Katie. She also told me to dress down next time to attract less unwanted attention. It's a bit upsetting, but I guess I'll have to do what's best. So I listened to Katie's advice and ditched the OTT dress. Just like she said, people actually stopped staring at me. Here, hold this. You look really good holding books. Huh? That sounds kind of weird. But it's fine, though. She probably wanted my help but was just too shy to ask. After the morning classes, I went to buy a bunch of lollipops, and that might look odd to Katie, so I let her know about how lollies are my special anxiety remedy. People here seem to be quite judgy, which got me a bit uneasy. You want one? Aw, poor you, but no thanks. By the way, I'll have lunch with David today. You know, the cute jock in our math class? So you're on your own this noon, okay? Then she quickly left without waiting for my response. I didn't know having lunch alone was so boring. Everyone has their own group, except for this one guy wearing a hoodie and a mask. H hi can I join you? But he didn't even reply, just stood up and moved to another seat. Did, did I do something wrong? Feeling the anxiety taking over, I immediately took a lollipop to calm myself down. And it's doing a wonderful job at making me feel better. But suddenly, someone snatched it out of my hand. I chased after him, but slipped on someone's foot and fell hard on the floor. Panicked, I burst out crying, and I heard the guy that took my candy say, Huh, huh, feather the toddler. Then everyone laughed at me again. Luckily, a guy spoke up. Stop this nonsense. What are you going to do if she's injured? Oh, wait, it's the weird guy from lunch. He checked on me to make sure everything was fine, then quietly went back to his seat. I didn't even have the chance to ask for his name before the teacher came in. This guy was so strange, but there was one thing I didn't understand. Why was Katie also laughing? Back home, Katie came to find me in the playroom, and I questioned her about the incident earlier, and she quickly apologized as she thought they were just joking. She then suggested going shopping and offered to buy me something to cheer me up and so I agreed immediately. We went to the mall the next morning, and I had the best time. We had iced coffee and some delicious pudding. Katie also got me an adorable little hair clip, and so I bought her a bunch of new clothes in return. We were about to head home when Katie said, Hey Feather, um, I have a cousin whose sneakers are falling apart. Would it be okay if you helped me get him a new pair? Of course, anything for my best friend. Making my best friend happy was the most wonderful feeling in the world. I'm so grateful to have such a lovely person like her to come into my life. But then, the next day, I walked into class to see Katie being all lovey-dovey with the boy who took my lollipop. So that's the David that she mentioned, and on his feet were the brand new sneakers that were supposed to be for her cousin. Why is he wearing the shoes I bought? Then Katie pulled me outside and explained profusely, Feather, calm down. The, the shoes were too big for my cousin, so I gave them to David. I didn't lie to you, I promise. Fine. Please just don't let me see him wearing them again. I felt really bad since Katie seemed really sad after hearing what I said. At that moment, David approached me. What's up, toddler? You got a problem with my new kicks? I froze in fear. Then thankfully, an announcement came through the speaker. David Peterson, please come to the principal's office immediately. Turns out he's in trouble for spray painting a teacher's car. At least someone already helped me teach him a lesson, but that wasn't all. A few more of my classmates also got detention for cheating on the math quiz yesterday, while some others got caught skipping classes. It was such a crazy morning. It's as if someone was trying to play the hero here. Finally, it's lunch break. Hoped things would be better in the afternoon, but... Huh? What is this? A poster of me? It also says underneath, Feather the toddler is the snitch. Katie took a look at it and said that the best way to deal with these kinds of jokes was just to play along. Um, I'm not sure about that, but it seems like the only way now. And so, I climbed on an empty chair in the cafeteria and started speaking loud and clear. Mm, may I have everyone's attention, please? Hi, I am Feather the Toddler, and I am proud of it. Instead of getting the response I'd hoped for, what I got back was food. The whole cafeteria was laughing and throwing food at me. I covered my face trying to dodge it, but the floor got slippery from all the greasy food, so I ended up falling. Oh no! I scratched myself! 
I could only lay on the ground out of pain. People finally stopped as they saw me bleed. All I could vaguely hear was a familiar voice calling my name. I woke up in the hospital to find Liam sitting next to me. Feather, you're awake. Do you feel pain anywhere? Well, Liam? Why are you here? Where's Katie? Katie? You're still worried about Katie? She's the one who was behind all this. She told the principal about your classmates and told everyone it was you to make them hate you. What? How is that possible? Turns out the guy who was always wearing a hoodie and mask was Liam. Liam had always been suspecting something shady in Katie's behavior. So, after failing in warning me about her, he decided to look out for me himself instead. I cried and tried to hug him despite the pain on my arm. Then, Liam showed me a shocking video of Katie talking trash about me to everyone. Oh, why was Feather carrying my books, you ask? It's because her parents work for my family's corporation and she'll do anything I tell her to as long as I give her some money. <laughs> Seeing the anger and also disappointment in my eyes, Liam calmed me down and said he had a plan to expose my so-called best friend. When I returned to school a few days later, I stormed straight over to Katie. It's you! You're behind it all! I already know everything. <laughs> Stop being ridiculous, Feather. You got busted and now you're trying to blame me. Drop the act. No one's falling for it. At the end of class, Katie suddenly gathered everyone. People, head over to the lecture hall. I have something very interesting to show you guys. Oh boy, I wonder what else she has planned. Liam and I quickly followed the crowd and found Katie standing on stage. Oh, Feather, I'm glad you're here. This is about you after all. The screen started playing a video of me sitting on my swing, playing with my dolls, and taking armfuls of candy out of the pantry. Do you see that, everyone? Feather is just a toddler in a teenager's body. Such a weirdo. I was waiting for everyone to start laughing, but the crowd stayed completely silent. Then Katie hesitantly continued. Not only that, she's also the poser who snitched on us. Then, to her surprise, the angry crowd started booing and shouting at Katie, saying she is the evil snitch. Then they turned to me. Your rooms are actually pretty cool. I wish I had a snack pantry like that. It's so awesome. Katie sounded panicked as she continued talking more trash stuff about me, but no one listened. Turns out, Liam had set up a group chat in which he'd posted proof of Katie's actions, including the video of her talking to David, and also pictures of her coyly walking out of the principal's office after she must have snitched on everyone, and her putting up that mean poster about me. Katie, you're the one embarrassing yourself. Everyone knows that you're a snake in the grass. I trusted you, and what I get back are all these lies and schemes. I feel so ashamed for ever calling you a friend. As Katie looked around at the unimpressed-looking crowd, she realized her game was up and quickly fled the scene. Later on, we arrived home to see my angry-looking parents standing next to Katie's mom and dad, who had all their luggage packed ready to move out. Yes, Liam had already told them everything. In the end, Katie's parents made her apologize to me. Only after a lot of persuading did my parents let them keep their jobs. I never saw Katie again, but I did make a bunch of new friends that I invite around sometimes. The snack pantry is a big hit. <laughs> now, I wear whatever I like without worrying about being judged. Most of all, I'm enjoying my school life, and it's all thanks to the help of my trusty soulmate, Liam. I dashed along the hallway, then skidded to a halt in front of the classroom door. Ah, uh, I was late. Again. Miss Anderson, what's your excuse today? Morning, sir. I'm sorry, but my spaniel hit my shoes, then I tripped over a package by my front door, then my heap of a junk car wouldn't start, and... That's enough. Good God. Please sit down. Ashley already took attendance. What? So much for my perfectly crafted excuse. Mr. O'Shaughnessy totally would have let it slide, but she had to ruin it. I'm Ashley. I'm pretty. I'm perfect. Everybody likes me. Well, no one likes teacher's pets, Ashley. Think I'm being too harsh on her? <laughs> Just ask anyone about Ashley Mae Anderson. Ashley's father's a vet with a medal of valor. They even had dinner with the president at the White House. For her sweet 16, she rented out the swankiest club downtown for an entire weekend. And David Guetta DJed. Ashley dated two college boys at the same time, and when they found out, things got physical. Okay, okay, maybe not all of that was true, but who cares? Look, the main character here is me. Hi, my name's Ashley Mae Anderson. I know, what a freaky coincidence, right? But that's the only thing we had in common. 
Because unlike popular Ashley, I'm just a normal teen who's just minding her own business. But then she transferred here and messed up everything. This happens every time I open my locker. And they're not addressed to me, but to Ashley. Jeez, why do boys go so cuckoo bananas over that pretentious princess? I gathered that whole cluster and dumped them on Ashley's desk. Here's your delivery for the day. Oh, I have no use for those things. You can keep them if you want. Ha, <laughs> how snobby. I know those rumors weren't all lies. Alright, if you said so. Being mistaken for Ashley was so annoying that I did consider putting a sign on my locker or something. But I suppose sometimes it actually had its perks. Like when I accidentally knocked over a trash can in the school's parking lot. But upon knowing my name, the janitor said my father was his commanding officer back in the day and let me off. And believe it or not, these mix-ups didn't only happen at school. Once, my family went out for dinner and the staff at this restaurant thought we were the other Andersons. They must be some really important people cause the super attentive waiters topped up our drinks for free and gave us complimentary desserts. Pretty sweet, right? Only when we were leaving, things almost went south when the manager shook my dad's hand and said, Thank you for your service. My dad seemed confused, but fortunately, I dragged him away before they busted us. I mean, Ashley's been enjoying these privileges her entire life, so it's fair I benefit a little from them. Especially since I have to endure being called her Walmart version. Anyway, back to me. I arrived home to find a teary-eyed girl sitting on our front porch. She must be one of Billy's exes. If your brother's a jock that all girls flock around, you'd get used to this real soon. He went through girlfriends quicker than hair gel, and he always had some peeves about them, like Mandy, too clingy, Katie, too dramatic, Maggie, too flirty. The list goes on. Then, as soon as my backpack hit the bedroom floor, my door burst open. Hey, I need your help. What? Need a hand to make up with Cry Barbie out there? She's ancient history. Check this out. Her name's Jane Brown. Ain't she a beaut? I immediately recognized her. She's the waitress that he kept eyeing the other day. Now, he needed my help to ask her out and not seem creepy. So, I suggested taking her to his friend Alexander's party this weekend. How do you know about that? Isn't that cool people exclusive? As if I wanted to. I was added to their group chat by accident because they thought I was Ashley. <laughs> right. Hot Ashley. You should come too. I'll be with Jane, but Victor will be there. Wait, I'll see my crush at that stupid party? Sign me up then. Jocks, cheerleaders, stuck-up kids. This place was packed with people like Billy. My brother briefly introduced me to the host Alexander, while Madison followed him around looking all shy and gooey-eyed. Wasn't she bothered that all Alexander seemed to care about was if anyone had seen Ashley? I also got to officially meet Jane, but the person I was looking for was Victor. He's so much more than just a cute face in the crowd. He's the peanut butter to my jelly. But before I could talk to him, a bunch of dudes popped out of nowhere. This is Ashley? Oh man. I thought she was supposed to be pretty. No offense, though. She's a six if you squint hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm squinting now and you're barely even a two yourself. No offense, though. What, what did, did you say? say? <laughs> Don't worry. You could still go after pretty girls. They just need a crate of fear first. The crowd suddenly felt silent and stared at us. This party is so lame. Peace out, losers. Anywhere is better than that stuffy elitist hellhole. But it's a bummer I didn't get to talk to Victor. He's Billy's best bro and used to come hang out at our place pretty much every day, but not anymore. Guess has been avoiding me ever since I told him I had feelings for him. <sighs> I was going to settle things with him tonight, but those jerks ruined it. Do I need to print my own t-shirt saying, I'm Ashley, you must be looking for Ashley? The next day, while looking for Victor, I heard someone calling my name. But I turned around only to see Alexander calling for, ugh, Ashley. So annoying. I saw him make a move on her, but she said guys like him bored her, then proceeded to list all his flaws. Oof, harsh. From then on, I tried my best to avoid Ashley, and thought my life would be light and breezy. But nope. On the contrary, I found myself in a series of unfortunate events. One day, a stack of religious magazines randomly showed up on our doorstep. But the real kicker was, they were all addressed specifically to me. 
and there was absolutely no way to convince my family and neighbors that I wasn't a member of the Church of Scientology. Two days later, all of my clean clothes had some weird stains and holes on them. I had to beg Billy to lend me some of his. That day, I went to school in an old jersey, looking like a midget. <sighs> then, this Monday, I became the center of attention by showing up with my face covered in pimple patches and band-aids. Well, that's because I woke up to countless cystic acne and didn't have enough patches. This resulted in me being called the mummy for five days straight. But the final straw was my car having two flat tires. The clock was ticking, so I asked Billy to take me to school. However, he just flat out refused, saying he'd already promised to pick Jane up. No other choice. I had to ride my old bike. When I saw Billy's car in the driveway, my pettiness got the better of me, so I splashed my half-empty milk carton over the windshield. I'm on my way. Oh my god, you little brat! Sorry, babe, you won't believe what my sister just did. Seeing Billy's reaction was chef's kiss. <laughs> you got it coming, big bro. The next day, my car was fixed, so I managed to get to school early. Looks like my string of bad luck was finally over. Okay, let's see who wants to confess to Queen Ashley today. From... Victor? Oh no, why him? I stood there, frozen with a letter in my hand, still processing the situation when a friend came and showed me something on her phone. It's a video of me singing and dancing in my room! No one's supposed to see this, ever! It had been uploaded by some throwaway account, but who else could it be but... Jesus Christ! Billy! I rushed home to see Billy and Jane cuddling in the living room. How's he still so calm after pulling that on me? I confronted him, and he didn't even bother denying it, and even said that's what I deserved for vandalizing his car. We screamed and shouted at each other, but before we ended up in a fistfight, he stopped and stumped off to his room. I was still fuming, glaring at his shadow, when I saw Jane gawping at me in delight. Don't blame your poor brother too much, dear. It was I who pulled the strings. What? Jane? But why? We'd barely even interacted. Then she went on about all of my mishaps lately were her doings. Yep, my so-called bad luck, it had been Jane all along. That's for stealing Alexander from my sister. He's her first love. Do you know how heartbroken Zoe has been? Wait, Zoe who? And why on earth would I choose to mingle with that playboy Alex? Kudos to this girl for thinking I could ever steal someone's boyfriend. Hello, I'm still struggling with my lifelong crush over here. I tried to tell her she made a mistake, but she wouldn't listen. Stop denying it. I know it's you. You're East High's Ashley with a vet dad. That checked all the boxes already. Hold up. There's another Ashley Mae Anderson in our school. She's Ashley with E-Y. I'm Ashley, E-I-G-H. Her dad is a war veteran. My father is a veterinarian. Oh, snap. Good lord. She devised this intricate plan, approached Billy just to make it work, and was successful for the most part. Well, apart from having the wrong person. Just amazing. Jane apologized and promised to take down the video. However, she wanted me to help her take revenge on Ashley in return. I didn't want to get involved, but I also never wanted to be on her bad side again, so I reluctantly agreed. But if you think about it, Jane's story didn't quite add up. Ashley seemed to have a holier-than-thou attitude and had dozens of admirers waiting in line. Why would she get in between them? Not to mention, Alexander's a notorious player who Ashley already ruthlessly rejected. I believe there's more to this. As expected, thanks to that video, my school life was now even more awkward than usual. But it didn't matter, as I was too preoccupied with Operation Ashley. Today's mission? Approach her after cheerleading practice. I stood in the corner, behind the bleacher, waiting for my chance. But before I showed myself, I saw Madison march over, say something to Ashley, then storm off. After that, Ashley started… sobbing? I didn't know what happened, but I felt bad for her. So I tried comforting her, but she kept brushing me off. Look, you can keep the Ice Queen Act all you want, but I know you have feelings too. I thought you might have something else you want to share with me, not just the name. And it was like I pulled a lever that let out all of her bottled-up emotions, and we had a heart-to-heart -heart all afternoon.
Just as I thought, things weren't what they seemed. We'd better talk this through with one another. So I set up a meeting at a cafe in the South Coast Plaza, as they wouldn't dare to cause a scene in public, right? Anyway, Ashley clarified that Alexander and her weren't a thing, while assuring Zoe that she deserved a guy much better than him. But Alex was really sweet to me. He gave me this present on our one-month anniversary. Did he say it's his grandmother's? Yeah, he tried giving me an identical one on my birthday. I'd say you dodged a bullet when you two broke up. Please, look at yourself first. You two flirt with boys left and right and still act all high and mighty. Get off that high horse. Ashley seemed genuinely hurt by Jane's words that it took her a while to speak up. I'm just sick and tired of being the popular girl who has to live up to everyone's expectations. It's too exhausting. I thought transferring here would mean a fresh start, but everyone still has this impression of me which I can't seem to change. The rest of us looked at each other in confusion when we saw how sad Ashley's situation actually was. We didn't know there were so many downsides to being high school popular. Ashley, you know you can just be yourself, right? The world will have to accept you for who you truly are. If people don't like you, then so be it. Yeah, if they don't, that's their problem, not yours. You can't fit into a mold to please everyone, because there's no such thing. I don't want to agree with her, but she has a point. Let the whole world know the real Ashley. And you too, Zoe. Someday, you'll find a good guy who loves you for yourself. Alright, girls, that's settled. Now, I have to deal with my own mess. Billy found out the truth and now he's been ghosting me. But I swear to God, I'm in love with this guy. Gotta go. Bye! I couldn't believe I was rooting for my saboteur and her accomplice to be together. But here I was. Go get him, tiger! The next Monday, Ashley walked to class and had lunch with me instead of Madison and her clique. And, of course, this didn't go unnoticed. You left us for her? What is she? You're not hot, sister? <laughs> Before I could clap back, Ashley stood up and unleashed her inner sass. This is me living my life as my true self. If any of you bootlickers have something to say about that, you can shove it where the sun won't shine. Sweet Mary Jesus and Holy Spirits! Who knew she had it in her? Her words completely decimated those hyenas. And suddenly, someone grabbed my wrist. Victor? Slow down! Where are you taking me? Besides, you got the wrong person, and also the wrong address for this. You should give it to her yourself. Actually, I sent it to the right girl, but apparently, she still hasn't opened it. Wait... What? And you're right, I should tell her myself. It's just that Billy and I made a deal that sisters are off limits, so I thought it's better to avoid you. But hearing Ashley talk about being herself made me realize that I'm sick of hiding my feelings. I'm gonna make Billy see how sincere I am for you. Before I do that, Ashley, I like you. And, um, will you go on a date with me? Yes! Um, I mean, yeah, I suppose that would be cool. This is beyond my wildest dream! Not only do I have a brand new friend, but also a date with my dream guy! Fortune is finally smiling on me. <laughs> finally, my first day at school has come. Yay! This special occasion called for my favorite hoodie. Super cool, right? <laughs> but then, out of nowhere, I was blocked by a group of boys and their cheesy pickup lines. No time for monkey business, but they wouldn't let me go. Hey, do you know who I am? I'm... Everything suddenly went blurry. Oh no, my glasses! I stumbled around trying to grab them back, but got shoved to the floor. Everyone scram. Give me that. I looked up and vaguely saw my hero offering me a hand. He gave me my glasses and I profusely thanked him. But he just gave me a cold look and walked off without saying a word. Strange. Oh, by the way, I'm Hazel Palmer, 17 years old. But I'm not here as a student, but a teacher. Yes, you heard it right. Not to brag, but I'm kind of a genius. <laughs> I even got offered a position in my college's research project, which I have rejected to pursue my dream of becoming a high school teacher. So here I am on my very first day of fulfilling it. First, I was introduced to the other teachers, but unlike what I had in mind, they just threw me judgy looks. 
Luckily, after the meeting, a young teacher named Rebecca kindly welcomed me and even tipped me off about some of the rebels at school. Now time to meet my students. As soon as I finished my introduction, the whole class immediately turned into a beehive. Miss, how about we continue this lesson at the movies tonight? Mullet, Paris knows. This guy must be the notorious Lucas that Rebecca warned me about. Please, as if you'd date someone who would wear such a goofy hoodie. Yeah, who let a weeaboo teach here? Jeez, I didn't expect this reaction. I tried to restore the silence, but to no avail. Ugh, I'm out of patience. Quiet, or else you'll all get Fs. Thank God it worked. Whew, that'll show them who's in charge. But here comes another problem. No way! There's gotta be someone who's really here to study, right? Okay, who is our class's top student? Ethan! Ah, didn't he help me in the hallway? But it looked like he didn't recognize me. Okay, let's see. Ethan, right? Could you solve this equation? Uh, equation? N no, equation. I suppose spelling is a bit hard for a numbers person like you. And the whole class burst into laughter. Jeez, this guy was unbelievable. Hmm, how about the second best student? Cassie Santago? That name sounded just like my old classmates. I turned to the corner where an arm reluctantly raised. Oh my, it's her! So good to see a familiar face here. But why is she avoiding me? That afternoon, while walking to my car, I saw Cassie and her friends picking on a girl. Upon seeing me, they immediately ran away, but I managed to catch Cassie. Cassie, since when did you become a mean girl? None of your business. Report me to the principal if you like. Then she strutted away, leaving me standing there confused. Since when had the sweet Cassie ended up on the dark side? Turned out, not long ago, Cassie's father passed away in an accident, leaving her to live with her stepmother. This must left her in so much grief that she put up this cold, reckless facade as a defense mechanism. That's so sad. So, to make Cassie feel included, and also to improve this whole class's performance, I came up with a master plan. More homework. Not finished? Minus points. And every lesson will come with a gift. A test during recess, and I asked Cassie and Ethan to help the other students. But when I called Cassie to the board, strangely, she couldn't do a simple equation. At first, I thought that it was just her being rebellious, but during the test that day, I noticed her copying Ethan's answers. Does that mean all her A's were from cheating? Not only that, the even shocker thing I found out was that Ethan was her stepbrother. After class, I came to talk to her, but she didn't pay me any attention. Cassie, I know the secret behind your A's. High scores mean nothing when they're not from your own hard work. But out of my business. <laughs> You're as much my friend as you are a proper teacher. I'd be pleased to tutor you. How about today? See you in the library after school. As if I care. Her words did hurt, but I guess she was just trying to keep her cold image. So I still waited for her, but she never showed up. No matter how much I tried, Cassie ignored me and kept cheating. During the midterm test, she even blatantly snatched Ethan's paper. It's true she's my friend, but I couldn't let it slide any longer, so I dismissed her test. That had to be done. <sighs> On the same day, while I was in the library searching for materials, I heard familiar voices talking. Miss Palmer is way too much. She even dismissed Cassie's test today. Can you believe this? Why can't she be understanding like you? Cut her some slack, Sadie. She's just doing what she thinks is best. So that's what my students really thought of me? After everything I did to try and help them, Yet all I got back was bad-mouthing? And Rebecca was so nice to defend me like that. No wonder they liked her. <sighs> a few days later, the unexpected happened. Cassie, Lucas, and a few others came and asked for extra lessons. Finally, they started to have another eye on studying. But little did I know that it's just a ruse for my dear students to turn the following days into a nightmare. And the instigator was Lucas, I supposed. One day, I almost fainted upon finding a huge ant nest inside my bag. The other day, my pants were stuck to the chair with some gum. <sighs> Fortunately, Ethan always showed up in time to help me. He's such a riddle. Unlike before, not only did he try to defend me in class, but he also helped me carry my textbooks. But I didn't expect him to care that much. One time, I saw him at the car wash where I worked part-time. I quickly hid behind a car, but Ethan just kept walking towards my wash box. I'm here to see you, so no need to hide. Let me give you a hand. After my shift, Ethan took me home. We talked a lot, and I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my mom's health condition and how I took this part-time job to cover her hospital fee. This side of him was far different from the normal, and it was heartwarming. 
Suddenly, we noticed an elderly lady who seemed lost, so we offered to take her home. And guess what? She's the grandma of the notorious Lucas. I was truly surprised by how much of a rebel like Lucas cared for his nana. I could tell he really loved her a lot. Poor boy. She's the only family he got now. Lucas, I know studying is not your thing, but have you thought about how happy your grandma would be if you at least tried? Since then, Lucas stopped causing me any mischief, and so did the other students. Now they could even do simple math themselves. Baby steps. <laughs> Seeing my effort finally bore fruit, I set up a parent meeting to report students' progress. Halfway through my presentation, a photo of me cosplaying as Sailor Moon popped up on the screen. Oh my god, why is it here? How dare you let this childish thing teach my kids? Then she stormed off, followed by everyone else. I thought I finally had my students on my side. Turns out I never did. Then came the last straw, my mom's medical test results. I couldn't help but cry, letting all my bottled up emotions out. Then, suddenly, a hand laid on my shoulder. What's wrong? My mom's health turned worse, and she needs an urgent operation. I'm sorry to hear that. It's all gonna be okay. Be strong, Miss Palmer. I appreciated him comforting me, and when I felt a bit better, we decided to leave. But the door was locked from the outside. It must have been a prank from my students. Again! We tried banging the door and screaming for help, but eventually gave up and waited for someone to come. This quiet atmosphere sure does have a way of making people open up, and I got to know about Ethan. Seemed like both of us have problems with our beloved family. What's yours? I... I have a sister. You know who. That I really adore. But no matter how hard I try, she always builds a wall between us. Oh, wasn't this the first time Ethan talked about his personal life? He always put on a cold and distant mask. But I knew deep down he had his struggles too. I was so absorbed in his story that I forgot about being locked up and gradually fell asleep. Until a buzzing sound startled me. And countless phone cameras were pointing at us. Guys, check your phones. Look what Miss Palmer and Ethan have been doing this whole time. Oh my! A bunch of photos of me and Ethan have been uploaded on the school website. And from some angles, it looked like we were... Kissing! Oh no! I tried to explain, but they just threw me a disgusted look. And why was Ethan just standing here saying nothing? This soon reached the principal. He told me there would be a case hearing for inappropriate relationship with a student. How was this even possible? As I dragged my feet to the principal's office, suddenly, I heard familiar voices shouting. Why did you do that? I told you to find her weakness, and look what you got. Nothing. I've done everything I could. What else do you want? Everything? Then why is she still here? As long as she's around, she messes up our cheating stuff, and mom will get my head chewed off for being useless at school. Or is that what you want, brother? What? So, Cassie had been pulling the strings this entire time? And Ethan was her puppet, befriending me just to please his sister. I knew she hated me, but did Ethan have to be so heartless too? Cassie then caught my eye, so I ran away. I was still trying to process this when I walked in to see the school council glaring at me. You're an insult to the teaching profession, which leaves us no choice. I was ready for the worst, when Ethan rushed in. Stop! It was me who deliberately jammed the classroom's lock to get back at her for being too strict, but I accidentally got stuck too. There's nothing going on between us. And so, I was cleared of all charges, and Ethan ended up in a week-long suspension. Why did he do that after all? After such a long trial, I drove around town to blow off some steam, then saw Cassie fighting with a security guard. I found out that Cassie stole a bracelet and was refusing to call her parents. The guard said he'd have to call the cops, so I came forward as her teacher to bail her out. Cassie asked me why I helped her. But I didn't bother explaining myself and just left. Since that day, Cassie didn't attend the extra classes. After his suspension, Ethan returned with his offhand attitude. <sighs> no time to worry about those two. My mission now was to prepare my students for the upcoming finals and regain my prestige. Luckily, they started to take studying seriously and invested a lot in these tests. One day, when I walked into class, some students even asked me to help solve advanced exercises. Two weeks later, when the results came, my excited students all rushed over to me. Miss Palmer, thanks to you, the questions were the same as the ones you showed us the other day, so it only took us a blink to finish. What are they talking about? Before I could understand, the principal summoned me to his office. 
As I entered, he angrily showed me the math sheet that I was allegedly teaching in the extra class. What kind of work ethic allows leaking exam questions, Miss Palmer? Leak the test? Me? No! Please! No more excuses. You're fired. No, no! They can't punish me for something I didn't do. Someone must have framed me. I asked my students where they got that piece of paper, and they said it was already on the table when they came to class. So Cassie and Ethan must have been behind this. Good job, Ethan, for putting up their remorse act just to set up a bigger plan to humiliate me. Okay, then. They won. Unemployed and desperate, with hospital bills to cover, I had to work full-time at the car wash, as well as taking night shifts at 7-Eleven. But besides the measly wages was a bonus of rotten eggs and tomatoes, scornful looks and snarky comments saying I didn't deserve the teacher title. <sighs> the scandal truly turned my life upside down. Then, when I was at the hospital with my mom, suddenly Ethan rushed in and said he would clear my name. Clear my name? Wasn't he the one who put dirt on me? What was he playing this time? With nothing to lose, I reluctantly went with him. He led me to the school's control room. The principal was also there. Then I saw Sadie standing on stage. Ethan said it was her who discreetly put the math sheet on the table. What? But, Rebecca? I distributed the test like you said, but I'm scared. What if someone finds out? Don't worry, now that Miss Palmer's fired, who else can dig this up? I'm only taking back my position as the beloved teacher who can take cover for y'all. No, I have to tell the principal everything. Who would believe you? I would. Furious, I rushed over to the stage and confronted her. Rebecca, I thought you were my friend. How could you? Don't ask me. Ask your phony self. Weren't you just trying to get the students to like you? What nonsense was she saying? I'm just doing my part of being a good teacher. How could she be so selfish and cruel? Out of jealousy? Miss Palmer earned her students' respect with her pure heart. Look at you. The so-called love you have comes from buttering them up with all your lies. That's why they turn stubborn and make light of studying. I never knew you were that kind of person. How could you call yourself a teacher? The principal couldn't hide his rage, fired Rebecca, then apologized to me and offered me my job back. But after all these troubles, this school had completely drained me. I couldn't take it anymore, so I refused. As I was wiping away my tears, Ethan came to my side. Miss Palmer, I'm sorry for everything I did. I just tried to please Cassie, but now I know I was only hurting you. I've already known about that. I was about to leave when a group of students led by Cassie approached us. Then Ethan told me it was Cassie who helped him with the plan to bait Rebecca into admitting her actions. Sorry for all the horrible things I did to you. Please stay. We've learned a lot since you moved here. Please don't leave us. Such a crazy term. I ended up staying. I mean, this is my dream job after all, and I'm not one to give up that easily. I also talked to Cassie's stepmom about her studying. Turns out she didn't realize her strict approach was causing a rift between them all. Cassie, Ethan, and their mom had a talk, and now they seem to understand each other better. I was so happy for them, and we became friends after that. Time flies, and now my students, or my friends, to be correct, graduated, and would soon fly off to pursue their own dreams. Suddenly, Ethan dragged me to a corner. So from now on, we're no longer teacher and student, right? I guess, but so... But could you still teach me? Teach me how to love you. How is it possible that I've never set foot in a place this close to me before? It's kind of dark and eerie. If only it was covered in flowers, then it'd totally be a Disney castle. Oh, someone's here. I went to say hi, but she didn't seem very welcoming. Stay away from this spooky place before it sucks the life out of you, young girl. So that means you're not working here anymore? The maid just shook her head before she hurried off. Here comes my chance. Hey guys, Joe Casta here. And this Dracula-esque castle is none other than Mr. Joseph Williams. Are you wondering who that is? Hmm, I'm curious too. All I know about him is that he's my parents' creditor, and I'm here to ask him to extend the deadline for their debt. But as one of his mates just quit, I could work here to pay off the debt instead, right? Hello, I'm Jocasta, your new maid. No answer. Should I just come in? If anything, the master should blame the old maid for leaving the gates open. So I had to find my own way inside. Hello? I'm the new maid. Master, are you here? No? Not here. Not here either. Is he still sleeping at this hour? Oh, there he is.
Huh? He's not old and gray like I thought he'd be. I introduced myself, then he returned to his painting, and coldly said, Work off your debt? Fine. Let's see how long you'll last. Just keep in mind, don't ever make me angry. Oh, master, you're worrying over nothing. I wouldn't even care about you. But turns out he wasn't worrying over nothing. He's actually infuriatingly difficult. The curtains must remain drawn during nighttime. There must be absolutely no noise at all, and his bedroom is strictly forbidden. Who gave you permission to sit there? Oops, I forgot. I must keep a distance of ten feet from him at all times, even during meals. Phew, finally it's time to rest. Though I've been working here for a couple of days, I'm still not used to Master Joseph's ridiculous rules. Huh? What's that staring at me? Ah! Rat! There's a rat! Help! What on earth are you shrieking about at this hour? You dare to disturb my sleep? Master, save me! There it is! It's coming! He stood bravely like a warrior, ready to fight the beast. Look at his broad shoulders, his hair, his chiseled face, and... His every movement is so smooth. That hideous rat was finally running scared. What a relief! You're making a fuss over nothing. Move to another room tomorrow. This one is too shabby. Looking closely, my fastidious master looks kind of handsome, doesn't he? Well, living here isn't so bad now that I've got the hang of his rules. <laughs> Bring me a cup of tea. Yes, master. Here you go. Pass it to me. Huh? Are we off social distancing now? I excitedly handed him the cup of tea. But he missed it, and tea spilt all over him. Clumsy dummy! Can't you look at what you're doing? I hurriedly wiped the stain on his clothes and apologized profusely, but he roared again. Stop! How dare you come this close to me! Get out! Jeez, his temperament changed like the seasons. Hot, cold, hot, cold. Whatever. I'll just go home then. Indeed, no place like home. Oh, how comfy. I told Judy, my bestie, about my week working in the castle. Interested? Want to come with me someday? No, no, no chance. Haven't you seen anything unusual there? Then Judy said rumor had it that a mad scientist once lived there. And werewolves too. His horrible howls could be heard during a full moon. You have to be careful. There's a reason why no one goes there. Oh no, it's today. Wolves howling under the moon? Never mind, Judy is just being childish. Who still believes in such fiction? Definitely not me. So... Ta-da! I'm back again. Honestly, I need this job. I can't let him fire me, even if I have to cling to his leg and beg, but... Where is he? Should I... I opened the door to see him lying there, surrounded by dull paintings, while tools scattered everywhere. What happened? I tried lifting him, nudged him. Still, he wouldn't come around. Then suddenly, his eyes opened. Hey, the ten-foot rule doesn't apply because that was an emergency. Have you eaten anything since yesterday? As I thought... If you still want to kick me out now, you'll have nothing to eat. After that incident, Joseph seemed more at ease. He stopped threatening me with his rules and just let me ramble on. One time, when I was napping on the couch after cleaning, he even put a blanket on me. <laughs> I haven't slept yet, dear master. Then one day, a middle-aged woman appeared at the gate. She introduced herself as Joseph's mom and gifted him a beautiful bird. But she didn't come inside and just sarcastically said, Oh, my son's got a new maid again. This weird boy. So sorry for you, poor girl. I brought the bird to Joseph, excitedly told him that his mom just dropped by. Look what lovely present she got you. Lovely? That woman's just mocking me. I'm stuck in this place like a bird in a cage. I think it's a thoughtful gift. You seem to like painting birds. Stop prying. This is none of your business. Okay, I'm sorry. But it's your own choice to isolate yourself from the outside world. Come with me. I have something special to show you. Oh, this place is still as gorgeous as the first time I came here. Looks like Joseph is mesmerized too. See? The world is beautiful. You just need to look. We were walking along the blooming flower path. Then suddenly... He's coming! The wolf! Wolf! Then all the gardeners immediately scrammed in panic. What have I done to you, you morons? Beautiful, you say? Then Joseph stormed off. I tried to catch him, but... Ouch! I tripped over a rock! Oh, it hurts! It freaking hurts! Then, let me apply the antiseptic cream. No, that will only make it worse. Maybe doing something fun could ease the pain. I'll be distracted from this. Please, can we watch a movie? And of course, he couldn't refuse. Oops, awkward. Clearly, I didn't think it through when picking this rom-com. 
wonder what my master is thinking. Oh gosh, there's no need to be that emotional. His scary appearance startled me. Eyes turned white, mouth snarled, as if he wanted to eat me alive. I tried to stay calm to ask him what was going on, but Joseph was like a madman, frantically smashing things and howling. Stop, Joseph! Please don't do it! Ah, my arm! Realizing that he'd just hurt me, Joseph seemed to regain his senses. He then ran off in a panic. I quickly hugged him. It's okay. It's okay. Calm down. Once he'd felt better, he started telling me his biggest secret. Since childhood, he'd had difficulty controlling his emotions, which often led to outbursts of anger. Later on, the moon also triggered this reaction after his stepfather passed away on a full moon night, and it then became traumatizing because Joseph feared he'd been the cause of his death. That was also the cause of the tension between him and his mother. I think I was born with this strange condition. As a child, my stepfather used to give me some medicine to keep it under control. His stepfather used to give him pills? Judy also mentioned the mad scientist who used to live here. Is that... Hmm, I have to figure it out. One night, I sneaked into the room that Joseph forbade me to enter. On rummaging around, I found a tape that showed me the whole terrifying plan of his stepfather to regularly give Joseph a power-boosting pill as an experiment, and also to take him to the mountains to test out some new crazy invention. What on earth was that? But I can't tell Joseph right away. He needs to be mentally stable first. So I started off by taking him out for a walk, and when he felt comfortable enough, I suggested we go downtown together for some grocery shopping. He was just like a hedgehog, prickling up every time someone accidentally touched him. But, of course, I know how to tame this hot headmaster. Just like this. There you go. Then we started tidying and redecorating the whole castle to liven up the mood of this place. When we got to the last room, his stepfather's, he seemed a bit hesitant. It's been so long. This room also needs cleaning, else the furniture may become damaged. Do you know anything about your stepfather's videos? Uh, how do you know? Then Joseph searched for a memory card, then gave it to me. I was so scared that I hid it, and never dared look at it. I wanted to destroy it once, but on second thought, it contains the last images of my stepdad, so I've always kept it here. Huh? This wasn't what I meant. So there's another video apart from the ones I saw. This may shed light on everything. If you don't mind, can I watch that video? I'm quite curious. From that day, we never spoke of the videos again. Instead, we went for walks, cooked, and meditated together. And today's schedule is this art exhibition. Look at his surprised face. <laughs> they look familiar, right? Don't tell me you don't recognize your own artwork. It seems that each painting tells a story. I can't wait to know who the artist is. They must be an experienced and profound person. I knew it. These compliments will help him erase his own self-doubts. Back from the exhibition, we notice a delicious smell coming from the dining room. Who could that be? It was Joseph's mother. Joseph seemed surprised by his mom's presence, but I wasn't, because I was the director behind the scene. In fact, I secretly asked her to organize that exhibition. Watching the video cleared everything up. On that moonlit night, the mad scientist took Joseph to the mountains to test the effects of a super power-boosting concoction. But when he saw Joseph reacting abnormally, he panicked and ran away. So the accident happened. It wasn't Joseph's fault. He was, in fact, a victim. I told Joseph's mom the truth beforehand, which led to this touching reconciliation. Now that things were clear as day, they have untied the knot in their hearts. His mother decided to move here to help him overcome his trauma of the moon with me. Oh, he also told me about the time he dropped a teacup on purpose as an excuse to push me away so that I'd be safe. How sweet and caring he is. Oh shoot, who left this curtain open? I hurried over to close it, when suddenly a hand gently touched mine. Before you came, I really never thought I'd ever have the courage to face moonlight. But Jocasta, with you by my side now, anything feels possible. I was casually walking along the hallway, just minding my own business, when I felt a cold breeze rush through the hallway. I turned my head to see, and oh, it was Natasha. Ooh. I didn't mean to look her in the eye, but I did. Oh no, was she going to hit me? Panicked, I quickly glared down at my feet. My heart was thudding with fear, and inside my head, I repeated, Please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me. But to my relief, she walked past me. Phew! Hi, I'm Marcus, and you might be wondering why I'm so afraid of that girl, right? 
Well, there's a reason why her nickname is Silent But Deadly. She's the tallest girl in the school. Intimidating, and she never utters a word. The school was full of rumors about her, such as how the last kid who messed with her ended up in intensive care. Nobody, and I mean nobody, should ever look her in the eye. Not unless they want to end up unconscious. I definitely just had a lucky escape. Thankfully, not all the girls in my school were as terrifying as Natasha. Nope. Instead, there was this really cute girl named Naomi. She's beautiful, sweet, and gentle. Only, she's also super popular and is dating Nicholas, the captain of the basketball team. So I just kept my feelings to myself and carried on with my life. <sighs> but wait, where's my notebook? I guess I left it back in the science lab. So I rushed in there and, oh no, Nicholas was there and he was reading my notebook. I quickly grabbed it off of him, but it was too late. He'd already taken pictures of the song lyrics I wrote about my feelings for Naomi. Blast it! So let me get this straight. A nerd like you dares to daydream about Naomi? Uh, but we have a problem here. She's my girlfriend. Don't you know that? Uh, wait, it's not like that. I'll stay away from her, I promise. Nicholas gave me this unnerving look. Ugh, no good thing could ever come from a look like that. I braced myself for what he was about to do next. You have to do everything I say, else I'm going to ruin your life. Huh? Was he being serious? Judging by his devious smirk, yep, he was 100% being serious. I want you to ask Natasha out. Make sure you do it in front of the whole class. What? N Natasha? That scary girl? How could I? If you say no, the entire school will know about this. Then he waved his phone in front of me. Ugh, that vile Nicholas. But I couldn't risk my song being sent to everyone, so it looked like I had no choice. So the following day, I walked over to Natasha's desk and asked her, Natasha, um, will you be my girlfriend? The whole class was silent. Then they burst out laughing. She glared at me. Ugh, this wasn't good. I winced, preparing for the death punch. But instead, she let me out into a corner of the hallway. Then she gave me this weak smile, followed by a nod. Oh my god, did she just agree to be my girlfriend? This is crazy, it was completely beyond my expectations. But, whew, at least I was still alive, right? And that's how I ended up dating the scariest girl in school. She never spoke to me, not even a word. So I just helped her with her studies and carried her stuff around. We also exchanged numbers, but we only chatted through messages. Then one day when I was on my way to have lunch with Natasha, Nicholas strolled over to me and told me I had to take her to the cinema to catch this awful looking rom-com, which didn't seem like her thing at all. But what other choice did I have? Nicholas' words were orders. So I asked her over lunch, and to my surprise, Natasha smiled, then gave me a big thumbs up as agreement. When I went to pick up Natasha, she was already waiting for me on her porch. She walked over with a notepad. Curious, I asked her why she had it, and she wrote, I won't be able to text you during the movie, so this will have to do. Yup, Natasha has always been different from everyone else, so I didn't ask anymore. During the film, I noticed Natasha was crying, so when it was over and we stopped for lunch, I teased her. I saw you crying during the movie. She slammed her notepad on the table after she wrote, I was not crying. I just laughed and took her home. Maybe she wasn't as scary as the rumors made her out to be. To be honest, she was also quite cute. <laughs> the more time I spent with Natasha, the more I started to warm to her. There was something I liked about her, even though we had only communicated through sticky notes. I was desperate to hear her voice, so I hatched a plan. When we were in the library on a study date, I picked up an old book and blew the dust in her face. She almost sneezed. But before she did, she placed her hand over her mouth and raced into the girl's bathroom. Then she returned wearing a mask. After that, I tried to make her laugh. I quickly took two pencils from the table and stuffed them into my nose and started making ugly faces. But Natasha just glared at me and handed me a note. If you continue to do these ridiculous things, there will be payback. Ha! Huh, no way was I giving up. So the next day, when I saw her by her locker, I rushed over to her and began imitating the voices of the minions. I thought it would definitely work this time, but no. Instead, she punched me in the arm. Ouch! Yep, I now learned that the rumor about her inhuman strength was not an exaggeration. So I just gave up and our relationship continued. 
Then one weekend, when I was at Natasha's house to study, I went down to the kitchen to get a drink, just as her mom returned from the grocery store. As I helped her unpack, we started talking. She told me about Natasha's love of collecting glass art, the pieces of which filled the house. Then her mom touched my shoulder and thanked me for making her daughter happy again. Oh man, this was awkward. Now I felt super bad. To divert the convo, I asked if Natasha talked at home, but she just smiled and replied, Natasha's such a quiet kid, right? Then she told me how it's because Natasha's always been taller than the other kids, but she has a squeaky voice. This led to lots of teasing, and once she got so upset, she pushed a boy over and accidentally caused him to have a nosebleed. Since then, people started to shun her, so she withdrew from herself and stayed silent. Hearing this made me feel so guilty. What I was doing was wrong, and Natasha didn't deserve this. Then her mom said something that truly shocked me. In middle school, this one girl named Naomi was horrible to all. The mean comments got so bad she refused to go into school for weeks at a time. Huh? Naomi? The same Naomi I know? No way! Confused, I told Natasha's mom I needed to leave and left her looking bewildered as I ran out of there. My mind was a mess. I had a crush on a mean girl. And I'm just as bad, if not worse, after what I did to Natasha. Then my phone rang with a text from Natasha. It said, Sorry if my mom said something she shouldn't have. You okay? I texted back. We need to talk tomorrow, please. So we decided to meet at her house the next day. Alone in her living room, I told her everything, including my notebook, liking Naomi and how Nicholas was blackmailing me. Natasha, please, you have to believe me. I'm sorry I did this to you. I saw the hurt look in her eyes. Then she threw a note at me and ran to her room. The note told me to get out, but before I did, I stood on the other side of her door. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I couldn't continue our relationship on a lie. Look, I like you, and I don't want to deceive you anymore. After that, I left, and I also texted Nicholas that I didn't care if he told everyone. I'm done being his puppet. The next day, I expected school to be intolerable, but to my surprise, nothing happened. Instead, I saw that Natasha was trying to sort out her locker. A crowd had gathered around her, and Naomi was taunting her. How does it feel to know that even your boyfriend likes me more? <laughs> he doesn't like you. Natasha carried on sorting out her books, but I could see that she was fighting back tears. Furious, I pushed past them all and told Naomi to stop. She just jokingly said, You know, if you wanted to date me, you could have just asked. You didn't have to spend so many months suffering with this giant scarecrow. You're right. I did like you back when I thought you were a nice person. But now I know the true you. You're a coward who only feels good when it's at the expense of someone's misery. And I can see why you target Natasha the most, because she has two things you'll never have. A true, kind heart and a loving spirit. After that, I pulled Natasha away and told her how sorry I am. But she didn't even glance at me and just walked off. A few days later, after P.E. class, I was about to go to the locker room when a classmate, Dante, came up to me. Marcus, help me carry the P.E. equipment into the storage room, please. I have a stomachache. He hugged his stomach, then hurriedly ran away. Without thinking much, I packed up the equipment and carried it into the storage room. As soon as I put it down, I realized that Nicholas, Naomi, and some guys from the basketball team were waiting there for me. Oh, well, Marcus, do you really like that weird Natasha? Didn't see that coming. Then the whole group burst into laughter. You have no right to say that to her. Take a look at yourself. Whoa, are you defending her? Then she turned to Nicholas. Babe, show him who's the boss here. Then she pulled out her phone and started recording. Nicholas smirked, then grabbed my shirt collar with one hand and reached out his fist to me with the other. I tried to struggle but couldn't get out. He was too strong. Knowing I was doomed, I closed my eyes and awaited his punch, but suddenly a loud shout came out. Stop! I opened my eyes to see Natasha and a teacher standing in front of the door. Turns out she overheard Dante bragging to some kid about Nicholas's plan. So she came to my rescue. I looked at her gratefully, but she turned away to avoid my gaze. Meanwhile, Nicholas hastily released my collar and lied to the teacher that we were just chatting. But of course, he didn't believe him and summoned them all to the supervisor's room. After that incident, Nicholas, Naomi, and the rest of the basketball team were suspended from school for two weeks. They deserved it. But who cares? I have more important things on my mind, such as winning back Natasha.
I knew that her birthday was coming up, and I remembered how she loved glass art. So I bought her a glass art figure of Cinderella's glass slippers, with a ticket to senior prom and a card saying, Thank you, and happy birthday. I know what you did doesn't mean you forgive me, but I want to be your real boyfriend. So I left you a ticket for senior prom. If you come and dance with me, then I know you'll give me another chance. If not, then I know that it's over. But remember, you are a special person and deserve the best. The night of prom came, and I was stuck there all alone, feeling like a fool. This sucked, but after what I did, it was what I deserved. I didn't want to stick around here without her. So I was about to leave, but then my classmate tapped my shoulder and gestured for me to turn around. OMG. It was Natasha in the most beautiful crimson red dress. She walked over to me and then reached out her hand to ask me to dance. And of course, I accepted. As the song came to an end, she leaned in and whispered to me, Thank you, my hero. I can safely say that was the happiest night of my life, as it led to me having the best girlfriend ever. Oh, also her voice is actually really cute, although she does get annoyed with me when I tell her that. <laughs> Ugh! Why wasn't this jerk opening the door? I carried on with my thudding until my hands hurt. So it seemed like she'd gone already. What a sly fox. So the woman who lives here is my mom's friend, Carol. My mom, being the kind-hearted person she is, lent her some money to get herself out of a tricky situation. The problem being that Carol hasn't paid it back, and now she was ghosting my mom. Do you know what the worst part is? That money was for my college fund. Fueled with rage, I kicked the air to release my anger. But, oops. I watched in horror as a pebble flew through the air in slow-mo, then hit a car window. Oh, dear. Swallowing my fear, I snuck closer to the car to inspect how bad the damage was. Suddenly, the car door opened and two thugs stepped out. I tried to stay calm, apologized, and offered them some money as compensation. Unexpectedly, these guys grinned. Okay, sweetheart. If you want to make up for it, then follow us. Just like that, one of them grabbed my wrist and pulled me away. Ugh, as if they were going to harm a defenseless girl. But too bad for these two doofuses. They're actually looking at a Taekwondo black belt master here. I was about to throw an axe kick when suddenly a guy appeared out of nowhere. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Before I had time to blink, he lunged at the guys like a warrior and ended up beaten black and blue. <sighs> really? Who's rescuing whom now? Without hesitation, I threw a few kicks that made the two thugs turn pale. They ran back to their car, and when they were out of my kicking range, they turned their heads and sarcastically said, We spared you this once. Oh, and choose a better boyfriend next time. <laughs> I looked down to see the pathetic guy writhing on the ground. Oh yeah, I'd almost forgotten about him. He was pretty useless in a fight. But hey, at least he tried to help me. So I took him to a nearby medical station to bandage the wound. His name's Tyler. He's skinny, but yeah, pretty heroic, I must say. He still seemed to be in pain, so I offered him a ride home. But he quickly refused. Okay, fine. He must have been scared off by how fierce I appeared to be. Yet, as soon as I turned my back to walk away... Wait, something's wrong with my phone. What now? Your number isn't in it. Man, it's 2022 already, and he's still using that outdated pickup line? Still, I burst out laughing, then put my number in his phone. After that, we started messaging every day. He sent the cutest memes, and it made me feel good. To be honest, I know I can be kind of intimidating, so having a sweet guy like Tyler take an interest in me made my heart flutter a little bit. And there's no denying that he's cute. A real softie. Well, he is a music school student. A legit singer-songwriter to watch out for in the future. And so, you know, we became a couple. However, it didn't take long for me to realize that there was something very strange about this guy. I mean, 100% of our dates were at fast food restaurants, and while I was ordering a Coke, Tyler would ask the staff for an extra cup and ice. I still remember how surprised I was 
when I first saw him surreptitiously pull out a bottle of dark-colored water from his pocket. Oh, but you're not meant to bring outside drinks in. Don't worry, this is black coffee. It's basically the same color as Coke, so no one will know. Huh? Did I hear him wrong? Turns out I didn't, as this became a regular occurrence whenever we were out to eat. <sighs> but that's not all. On a rare occasion, we went for a fruit salad with burrata cheese. I almost choked on my food when Tyler took out a container of yogurt and tipped all the fruit on the plate in it. Well, and here comes fruit yogurt, but I'll put it away for later. It's not so right to eat this here, isn't it? <laughs> then one day, when it was our third month anniversary, Tyler said he was going to take me to this amazing French restaurant. Wow, I was so excited as he finally broke his rules. But turns out, it was just going to be another typical Tyler date. Things had gone wrong since the first minutes. When he parked up, he started searching his car for change. He even made me look down the side of the seat. Why, you ask? All because the meter was two ninety, but he didn't want to pay three dollars and lose a dime. Seriously, a dime! He ran off to find it and left me sitting there alone and hungry for twenty minutes. When he returned, he had this huge grin on his face as he waved the dime in my face. Oh boy, I was so mad. You're probably thinking it couldn't get any worse than that, right? Wrong. Not only did he order a starter as a main dish, but he also asked if there's a discount if he didn't get dressing on his salad. After eating, he rushed off to the restroom and left me with his wallet to pay. He arrived back just as I was about to tip the waiter $10. Seeing this, Tyler leapt across the table, grabbed the $10, and switched it for a nickel. Yes, I repeat, a nickel! Meanwhile, the surprised waiter sarcastically said, Sir, thank you very much for my nickel tip. The customers close by all tutted at us. I sunk down into my seat, willing for it to swallow me up. Jeez, this was so humiliating. No surprise, I was in a bad mood as we left the restaurant. I was so annoyed I couldn't even look at him. He tried taking my arm and asked me what was wrong. Flinching away from him, I said, Seriously? Do you even have to ask? At that moment, a luxury car pulled up alongside us. The car window lowered, and O-M-G. Inside was Victoria T, this popular teen singer. Before I could register what was going on, Victoria sarcastically said, Oh, look who's here. Isn't that my poor ex? Can't gold dig me so you turn to this girl, huh? But your new plan doesn't seem to be working too well either, honey. And the car sped away. So, it turns out he's a professional gold digger? I mean, he hadn't actually asked me for any money, but there's no denying he was stingy. No wonder he never took me back to his place. There was a time when I was so tired of some family stuff at home that I just wanted to come over to his and rest for a while. But he made some excuse about his house being messy. Now I knew he was just keeping distant with me, so later he could dump me easier without any attachment. <sighs> I was so furious I made a scene, meaning to expose his cheap shots for the whole world to see. Tyler was so embarrassed he fled the scene right away. Whatever. Good riddance. And since then... I didn't hear anything from him again. But, to be honest, I also felt a bit empty not having him around. I missed getting the cute messages he used to send and the soppy look on his face as he sang love songs to me. Oh boy, I'm a big cheese ball, aren't I? Then, one weekend afternoon, I was taking a walk when I happened to see Tyler come out of a cafe. Um, does he work part-time here or something? So I hid behind a corner and then followed him. I have to admit, I was curious about where he lives. But wait, this road is so familiar. Huh? And it led to Carol's house, the woman who borrowed money from my mom. I was still full of doubt till he pulled out the key to open the door. Ugh. Like mother like son, huh? So. 
You both like to scam people, huh? Pay us back now. Uh, Stacy? Shut up! Scam's over. Pay us back. I'm sorry, but my family is... My mom's in the hospital now. So I heard him out, and turns out it was just Tyler and his mom, and his dad had run off with some other woman when he was just a little kid. Growing up, times were hard, so his mom borrowed money to pour into stock investments, intent on providing them with a better life. Unfortunately, this only led to huge debts. All this stress was detrimental to her health, and now she was in the hospital, and Tyler had no other way but to live frugally to pay all the debt and hospital fees. Stacy, I'm so sorry for hiding all this from you. I'll try my best to work to be debt-free and make it up to you. Oh my, my heart fell hearing Tyler say that. All the angst just disappeared. Instead, I pulled him in for a big hug. He was a doofus, and he was my doofus, and I wasn't going to risk losing him again. On my way home, I kept thinking about ways in which I could help Tyler. Suddenly, the wind blew a poster across my foot. A city's television singing competition with the prize up to $20,000. That's it, Tyler. Why not? This was definitely a sign. I sent Tyler a picture of the poster and told him he had to join. He was also really keen on the idea and started practicing really hard every day. He texted me each time he finished practicing, sometimes even at 2 or 3 a.m. The big day arrived. Tyler looked so cute in the suit I'd arranged for him. When he hit the chorus, our eyes met, which made me feel so sentimental. But out of nowhere, Victoria got up on stage, snatched the mic from his hand, and said, My apologies to the audience, but I have to expose this person. He and his mom manipulated people into giving them thousands of dollars, then never paid them back. This kind of man doesn't deserve to be here on the stage. He'll stain the whole competition. Vic... I appreciate your feelings for me, but I already have the one whom I want to protect. I wish you could find someone good for you and better than me. Ladies and gentlemen, it's true that my family is in debt, but we do not and never run away from this. No matter how tough our lives are, I still live true to my conscience and my passion for music. I came here with a pleasant and carefree attitude, so I don't care what people say about me. I just want to give all of myself to music and the audience. Thank you. And now, I'll carry on with the performance. And then, he started singing the song he wrote for me. At that moment, the music nerd was no longer there. Instead, there was a man with incredible inner power. I'm so proud of you, Tyler. Guess what happened next? Tyler won the first prize. I was bursting with pride. Then he immediately came to my house to give my mom the money. Huh? Please take it. Thank you for helping my mom when she had a hard time. Please find it in your heart to forgive her. She's sick and could use a good friend. Oh, but the thing is... So, turns out, Tyler's mom didn't borrow my college fund money. The two moms talked each other into stock investments. When they lost it, my mom didn't dare to tell my dad and me what she'd done, so she fabricated the whole lending money story. Ugh, mom. Unacceptable. After that, the three of us went to visit Tyler's mom at the hospital and gave her the prize money to pay off her debts. She burst into tears. Then the two moms hugged and apologized for being so stupid that their kids had to deal with the consequences. Crazy, huh? But you know what? Thanks to all this drama, I found the one who was also the debtor of my life. This was my first day at my new school, and so far, it was going pretty well. Can you believe the principal himself was giving me the guided tour, as well as showering me with praise? Amber. With your impressive grades and outstanding academic achievements, you'll fit in nicely here. This is Leo, my son. He's another excellent student here, and he's going to show you around. Leo looked at me from head to toe, 
then smiled and winked at me. Huh? Was he checking me out? And here's the library. Maybe we could study here together sometime. Um, sorry, but I prefer to study alone. Right at that moment, a guy walked past us to the librarian's desk. Oh. My. God. He totally had this whole cool bad boy look going on. I zoomed in to see what book he was holding. The Orion Mystery? Wow, nice taste. I've been really into ancient stuff these days, too. Leo must have noticed me staring at that guy, as he snidely said, I'd steer clear of the likes of him if I was you. His grades are pathetic, and he's probably only in here so he can take a nap. He's below your league, while I'm far more suitable. Thanks for showing me around, but seeing your smug and scornful attitude towards others proves otherwise. Then I left, leaving a stunned-looking Leo behind. I found my class easily enough, even without Leo's help. And my desk, yeah, there was no missing that. I mean, the huge bouquet with my name on it and a welcome hamper full of candy was a dead giveaway. And apparently, it was from the principal. Whoa. I knew he was glad I was here, but wasn't this a bit too much? Anyway, I shared all the flowers and candies with my classmates to get to know them better. So far, so good. And these two sweet girls, Jane and Ellie, walked to the canteen with me and showed me how to get the lunch tray using my student QR code. But then they pointed over to a group of students sitting next to the window and told me to go sit with them. Huh? Why can't I sit with you? You're not one of us. Then they went and joined another group. What did they mean by that? I looked around and noticed there were two menus, a delicious-looking one on the red board and a bland one on a blue board. Hmm. It seemed the boards correlated to the trays as more kids than not had the blue trays with the dull foods. I took my red tray full of tasty food and walked over to the window, where all the kids were sitting with red trays, including Leo. Hmm, there's something really strange about this school. I was pretty awkward and didn't know what to do when I saw the Orion mystery boy walking in with a blue tray. So, without thinking, I approached him. I saw you this morning in the library. You were checking out my favorite book. So, should I return the book or what? No, no, I just want to make friends. Stop hanging out with this loser. A straight-A student like you should sit with us. We're different. See? This was so stupid. So I told Leo I didn't need colored trays to tell me who I could and couldn't talk to, and that I was fully capable of making my own mind up. Leo and his friends looked furious, while the Orion mystery boy just grinned. Suddenly, a girl in the group spoke up with a super cold tone. Don't worry, Leo. This new girl will soon figure out what losers they are. Then she signaled for the whole group to leave. After that, the Orion mystery boy and I started talking, and he finally told me his name. It's John. Hmm. The blue tray kids were really nice. Way nicer than the red tray ones. I asked John what the deal with the trays was, and he said that this school divided its students into two groups. The red were top achievers, and therefore got better food, cleaner spaces at the canteen, just everything, while the blues were made to eat bland food and squashed into the corner of the canteen. Poof, this whole thing was dumb. So I continued hanging out with John and his friends. Only Leo and that girl he was with, Quinn, didn't approve. Turns out she's the best student around here, and that made her the leader of the Reds. On many occasions, Quinn and her minions had pulled me aside after class to tell me I should stay away from the Blues. But I didn't care. Then one day, the school announced that it was looking for the next school president. I wasn't that interested in it, but my friends were eager for me to sign up. If you're president, then you could make things fairer around here. Right. Better food, better tables and chairs. Please, we need you. Well, they did have a point. I really wanted them to have better things. And I suppose being school president would look good on my profile. So I signed up. But wow, I didn't think I'd be this popular. My friends completely supported me, made colorful banners and helped me come up with catchy slogans. 
And you know what? In the end, I got to the final round. Whoop! Now all I had to do was beat Quinn. But then, something awful happened at the school. I arrived to find a bunch of students gathered around something. I squeezed through the crowd and... Oh my god. The principal's beloved portrait was covered in red paint. Then across the loudspeakers, two names were called to the principal's office. John's and... Mine! Do you two know why I've summoned you here? John and I shared confused looks. No, huh? My portrait has been vandalized, and I know that Amber, you were the last one who passed the security guard yesterday. And John, you were caught on CCTV climbing over the back gate. Can you both please explain what you were doing so late at school? I couldn't find my math book, and I have an important math test coming up. So... I came back to try and find it. And what about you, John? I knew it. An exemplary student such as Amber would never do such a thing. But a troublemaker like you, on the other hand, you're expelled. I didn't do it. Please reconsider, sir. Please give me some time so I can find the one who's responsible. Very well. Seeing as it's you, Amber, I shall allow you one week to prove this boy's innocence. Ahem. Or his guilt. When we left the office, I asked John why he was sneaking about the school late at night. But he got all defensive. I had a thing. And it's none of your business. If you want to believe it was me, then do. Didn't you see what I just did? I defended you. Can't you just tell me? I had a thing, okay? My thing that you don't need to know. Then he left. I stood there feeling confused when Quinn, Leo, and their group walked towards me. Don't waste your time with him. Sooner or later, he's going to be expelled. Right, Quinn? But Quinn ignored him, then gave me a dagger look. I'm going to say this one last time. Stay away from him. Then they all left. Hmm. Why was Leo so sure that John would be expelled? I know they all hated John, especially Quinn. Could it be that... They framed him? Well, there's only one way to find out. I needed to keep a close eye on Quinn and see what she was up to. So after school, I followed Quinn all the way to the harbor. Hmm, it's like she was waiting for someone. Um, what on earth are you doing? My god, I had to press my hands over my mouth so I didn't start screaming. Turns out he noticed that I was following Quinn... So he followed me, too, in case I do something stupid. Suddenly, Quinn took her phone out to call someone. But then a strange thing happened. John's phone started vibrating. Um, why is Quinn calling you? John took his phone out and showed me the screen. It's just my mom. And when I turned around to see what Quinn was doing, she'd gone. Ugh, I lost her. I've been following Quinn for a whole week but it's led to nothing. <sighs> I was so deep in my thoughts that I accidentally dropped someone's backpack and all their stuff fell out. Ugh, it's Quinn's. Better pick everything up before she comes back. But then I saw something that caught my attention. It was a receipt for... red paint. Jackpot. I knew it was her. John was skipping classes today so I took a detour to his house after school to tell him. Huh? Why was Quinn standing outside his door? There was something seriously fishy going on here, so I followed them. They stopped at an abandoned house nearby, and I eavesdropped on their conversation. I think Amber knows something. Last time, we were lucky she didn't catch us dating at the harbor. But this time, what if she finds out? I've been working so hard for this school president campaign. I knew she'd go back for her math book. It would have been fine if the school didn't have that new camera at the back gate. Tomorrow, I will confess to the principal that I did it. You didn't do it yourself anyway. Oh, God. I couldn't believe it. Turns out, Quinn was meeting John at the harbor, so when she called someone, it was actually him. But being an expert at this secret dating game, he had her number saved as mom. They were hiding their relationship this whole time. And worse... They tried framing me so Quinn would win the election. Unbelievable! 
I couldn't stay quiet any longer, so I stepped out in front of them, told them I'd heard everything and that I was going to tell the principal. Then I ran off without letting them say a word. The next day, I was en route to the principal's office when I passed Quinn tearing down her election posters on the wall. Why are you doing that? It's okay. I know I don't deserve to be school president. Hmm. I thought you wanted to be president more than anything in the world. Why else would you play dirty tricks on me? So Quinn explained to me that she was running for school president to eliminate the discrimination here so that she didn't have to hide her relationship with John any longer. Oh, wow. I didn't know. I didn't expect her to have such a meaningful motive behind all this. My plan was just to fight for better things for the Blues team. But man, Quinn had a vision to change this whole school. Impressive. And there's one more thing. Since you're the principal's favorite student, we were afraid that if you become school president, despite your best efforts, things here would only get worse. So there was no other way for us. We had to. I'm sorry. It seems like I misjudged Quinn. And I didn't want John to get expelled, so I said that I'd take the blame for the portrait incident. But it's all my fault. You don't need to do that. No worries. I'm sure to ace the math test and win a prize for the school, so there's no way he's going to punish me. So at recess, I was heading to the principal's office. But before I could get there... I found myself being dragged into the janitor's closet. Oh, it was John. He was feeling guilty and didn't want me to take the fall. I was about to reply to him when I heard two familiar voices in the science room next to us. It was Quinn and Leo. Oh my god, we could hear them clearly through the ventilation hole. <laughs> I can't believe it worked. Amber is such a fool. There's no way she'll be allowed to run for president and victory will be mine. So, are you really going to remove the division between the two groups just to freely date your stupid boyfriend in public? <laughs> are you fooled by that too? Of course I won't. No way. That was only to trick Amber and John. What I'm going to do is make sure all troublemakers are going to be kicked out of school. What? I got played? Again? Ugh! I turned to John and, oh man, he looked disappointed. Don't worry, I know a way to get back at them. On election day, Quinn gave her speech, and unsurprisingly, she went on about how the Red Group brings more to the school and therefore deserves their privileges. She really believes she could make a fool out of this Amber, huh? When I stepped out on the stage, her jaw dropped. Yeah, Quinn, I didn't confess to the principal. Giving speeches in front of a crowd wasn't something new to me, so I was super confident. I'm sure you're all aware of how this school operates. We're divided into two groups and get treated very differently. What I see here is discrimination and prejudice, when in reality, this should be a safe place for all students to strive and reach their full potential. So, I'm standing here today to tell you that if you choose me to be your next school president, I will break the barrier. Let's say goodbye to red and blue trays, and hello to fairness and equality. After my speech ended, the crowd went wild. Wow. And surprisingly, some of the red group were cheering me too. Hmm. You're probably wondering why I didn't expose Quinn in front of the whole school, right? As I see it, she'd had a massive reality check. So I think that was enough. I also spotted the principal quietly sneaking off with his head down in the midst of cheers the whole school gave me. Could you guess who won? Yeah, me of course. <laughs> John came on stage and handed me flowers in front of a furious-looking Quinn. I walked towards her and whispered, Let's see how you're going to get rid of the troublemakers now. She just sneered at me, then stormed off the stage. Later, we heard that Quinn confessed all to the principal. Then she transferred to another school. What about me? Well, after I became school president, I stuck to my promise and began making some serious changes to the unfairness of the school. And John, did we become a couple, you ask? Oh no, we're just close friends. <laughs> I was grabbing a book out of my locker when some guy's shouts startled me. Hey everyone, the results are over here! 
Oh, it's just the results of the Mind Buzz, our annual high school general knowledge competition. People, what's the rush? Don't we all know what it'll be like already? See, nothing's changed. That's my name, there, the first place of Willowmere High, as always. And of course, what came along with it were endless praises from everyone. Way to go, Millie, you're our school superhero. Oh my gosh, you're amazing, I'm so jealous of you. Yep. Hi, I'm Millie, the girl who always aces every school contest and is therefore adored by the other students, all the teachers, and the principal. Later that day, as soon as I stepped out of art class, Alice, my excitable best friend, jumped out of nowhere and squealed out, I just found this really cool place. We have to go there right now. No chance. I have the final round of the blast from the past contest tomorrow. I mean, history is my forte, so I'm sure to win, but I still want to cram in some last-minute studying. Come on. We all know you'll win anyway. You even said that yourself. So let's just hang out for a little, please. Fine, but only because I'm an amazing friend. Hmm, okay, I have to admit, this place was actually kind of cool. It's an adorable cafe hidden at the end of a street corner. But wait a minute, what's up with that sticker on the window? Isn't that the Leafmore High School symbol? No way we're setting foot in that taboo place! I tried tugging on Alice's arm and gesturing for us to leave, but she stood her ground and replied, Come on, Millie, we have to try their croissants. All the food bloggers are talking about it. But this is Leafmore's territory. Look! So? It's not like anyone will recognize us. Before I could comprehend what was happening, she dragged me inside. Oh well, it seems like we've gone too far to draw back, so I may as well sample what this place has to offer. Why was our order taking so long? And what was with Alice? Ugh, how many selfies did one girl need to take? I was clenching my fist to stop myself from anxiously fidgeting when two boys walked towards our table. Hey cutie, I've not seen you in here before. What grade are you in? Oh no, how should I answer this question? I quickly turned away, pretending to rummage through my bag to avoid his gaze, but they still didn't leave me alone, as the other guy said, Wait, this girl doesn't seem to be from our school, are you? Oh snap, did he recognize me? My skin turned clammy with nerves and I thought I was going to throw up. Then suddenly a voice rang out. Sorry I'm late. Have you been waiting long? Then he plonked himself down next to us. Seeing that, the two guys left. Phew! But who is this guy? Do we know him? Oh my god! Evan, it's you! Mmm. Is that the new Calvin Klein cologne? It smells amazing on you. Huh? Evan? As in... Evan Summers, the top student in Leafmore, aka my biggest competition in tomorrow's contest? To Alice's excitement and my puzzled look, Evan just lightly smiled, then got up to leave. <sighs> He's indeed a cold angel. What? All he was to me was arrogant. You're probably wondering what the deal between Willowmere and Leafmore is, right? They're the two biggest high schools in this town, but like the same poles of magnets, they repel each other. The two schools have been rivals since forever, competing with each other from academic achievements to collective activities. In competitions organized by the town, such as marathons, Halloween decorations, or even cooking contests. And of course, the students from both schools despise each other so much that we have boundaries in town. For example, this cafe is only for Leafmore students, while only Willowmere students are allowed in that bookstore. Breaking these rules could lead to outright carnage. The schools take this super seriously. Hence, there's even a rule saying we can't interact with each other. And dating is a real no-no. You see, as the top student in Willowmere, I can't let anyone find out I've stepped foot in Leafmore territory, as if they do, my life won't be worth living. And also, because of my number one position, I have a responsibility to help my school win as many prizes as possible. And this history contest is no exception. I anxiously waited for the host to announce the results. And the last 20 points go to Leafmore High School, which makes them the winners of today's contest. From the other side of the hall, the Leafmore students erupted into applause, and they all charged at Evan and hugged him. Seeing the arrogant Evan with a triumphant face made me even more upset. Congratulations, you were amazing! Alice, we lost! Only by five points! Second place is still good, but it was me who was defeated by that Evan! 
Poor Alice is still trying to keep her shy smile at me. I didn't want to take it out on her either, so I quickly left. The next day I was walking along the school corridor, minding my own business, when I passed a group of students gossiping about me. Poof, she devil lost the quiz on purpose. Yeah, her question was so easy. Everyone knows that the first US dollar was printed in 1862. Why were they saying such mean things about me? I tried my best to ignore their jibes and distract myself with my phone, but what is this? Someone had uploaded a picture of me, Alice, and Evan all sitting together in that cafe the other day. Oh no. And we're still, from this angle, we all looked kind of close. Furious, I went to leave, but Polly, this annoying girl, blocked my way and mocked me. Millie, if you don't like this place, you could have transferred schools. Losing to Leafmore on purpose is just embarrassing. I did no such thing. Not that it's any of your business. I hurried away from her and her smirking friends. The problem is, it seemed like the entire school had seen that picture and concluded that I'm a traitor. At least things couldn't get any worse, right? Wrong. My bad luck continued when I got my English lit essay back. A B minus. This can't be right. I never get anything lower than an A. Ever! I was checking through my test when suddenly there was an announcement on the speaker, asking me to come to the principal's office. Millie, you're usually such an excellent student, but I've received some unpleasant news about you recently, and your grades are slipping significantly. I could only stare down at the floor and mumbled, I'm really sorry. I'd never been scolded by the principal before. This was the worst day of my life. Miss Garcia was silent for a moment before she continued. However, I still have faith in you, so I'm giving you one last chance to prove yourself. The town's hosting a Rube Goldberg machine camp and our school must win. Can you make that happen, Millie? I forced a smile and nodded. No problem, ma'am. The first prize will be ours. Trust me. This is my chance to show everyone that I'm devoted to this school. However, there's one teensy tiny problem. Physics is not my forte. It's all right. I just got to do my best, right? I spent the next two weeks planning, researching, and testing out ideas with my group. We finally managed to create the perfect Rude Goldberg machine. It includes 15 genius steps to complete the final task. We're surely going to secure all these bonus points. Finally, the camp weekend arrived, and I was super stoked to show off my team's entry. Tomorrow will be it. I'll get Willowmere's name back on top again. Then suddenly, Miss Garcia tapped my shoulder and gestured me over to an empty corner and worriedly said, Leafmore's machine is highly praised by the judges. At this rate, they're most likely to win, and that'll mean humiliation for us. Don't worry, I'm trying my best. We'll add some extra magnets and springs. It's no use. The only way we'll win over Leafmore is if their entry encounters problems. She sighed, then turned to leave. Feeling deflated, I stared down at my feet. That's when I saw a pocket knife, with Miss Garcia's name printed on it, lying on the ground. I picked it up and called out, Miss, you dropped your knife! But Miss Garcia didn't stop walking or turn back, and just did a snipping gesture with her fingers. Could it be that Miss Garcia meant... Yep, definitely. That's the only way. So that night, I waited until everyone else was asleep, then I snuck into the gallery and cut a piece of wire holding the light bulb of Leafmore's model. That should be enough. I was about to leave the room when suddenly the lights came on. What are you doing here? I... I... You just did this, didn't you? Um... Yeah? So what? Go ahead, tell on me if you want. This is all so meaningless. Then he sat down and started fixing his model. Huh? What's meaningless? Good God, he's so full of himself. Fine then. Just you wait, Evan. I'll beat you with my own talent. Let's see if you'll still be Mr. Arrogant then. It was my team's turn, and for the first three steps, the Rube Goldberg machine worked quite smoothly. But when it came to the fourth step, suddenly the wooden slide collapsed, causing the marble to fall to the ground and the machine to stop working. We all stared at each other in panic. No, 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 this couldn't be happening. We tested it many times this morning and it had worked perfectly fine. I rushed over to check what was wrong with the machine, but I struggled and couldn't find a way to fix it, when suddenly a voice said, Let me see. 
I looked up. It was Evan. I stepped aside to make room for him when suddenly Ms. Garcia appeared. I see what's happened here. Clearly, Leafmore High knew the only way they'd win was by sabotaging the best entry. The whole hall started to stir, but I felt my skin prickle with unease. I didn't think this was Leafmore's doing. Look at Evan. He didn't even bother telling the judges about last night's incident. Immediately after that, Leafmore's principal, Miss Harris, said, Miss Garcia, you can't go around accusing us without proof. Clearly, you're the one who feels the need for underhand tactics to win, not us. Then she held out her phone and circled the crowd so everyone could see. I gasped in shock. There on the screen was a picture of me standing next to Leafmore's model with a knife. Miss Harris continued. Seeing as we managed to fix it in time, we decided not to mention anything else about it. But then you dared to accuse us. The crowd glared and tutted at me, and I longed for the floor to swallow me whole. I put blood, sweat, and tears into creating our model, and now people just thought I was a cheat. The worst part was they were right. I was one. The jury went off to discuss this. Then they announced their conclusion. Willowmere had been disqualified. Immediately, Mrs. Garcia piped in. This is hardly fair. That was the action of one individual, not the whole group. I assure you that Millie is no longer on the team, so let my school continue to compete without her. I froze in shock. How could Miss Garcia do this to me? It had been all her idea, hadn't it? She'd given me the knife. The realization of what just happened hit me, and I fell to my knees and burst into tears. All that hard work and for nothing. Even Alice hugging me in comfort didn't release me from my gut-wrenching, sinking feeling. Then to my surprise, Evan said, Mrs. Garcia, can you explain why I found this knife with your name engraved on it next to our model? He raised the knife up for everyone to see. Oops, in all the stress of last night, I must have dropped it. Miss Garcia turned ghostly pale and everyone started to buzz about it. I can't believe you colluded with your students to do this. You're no different from her. Last night, Miss Harris instructed me to tamper with Willowmere's model, but I refused. As if we win, I wanted it to be fairly. The whole hall once again began to stir and gobbed on amazed as Evan continued. I'm so tired of the petty feud between our schools. It's so dumb and meaningless. The jury went off to discuss this further and came back with a new announcement. Both schools were disqualified. It's shameful. But, well, it's for the best. We really don't deserve to be here. Oh boy, that sure was eventful. The scandal between the two schools was hot gossip in the town for days. They even brought it up at the monthly town meeting. That's when the truth came out that Ms. Garcia and Ms. Harris had history. They were in the same year at school and were fiercely competitive against each other. So, years later, when both of them became principals of the two schools, they began this whole feud war. In the end, both principals were forced to leave their positions. So, now what? Well, there aren't any dumb rules about where I can go anymore, which is good, because I actually really like it here. I've learned my lesson, and I'm never going to let anyone pressure me into cheating ever again. Peace has returned to school life, and it feels good. Oh, and as for Evan, I'm actually studying with him right now for our next Blast from the Past quiz. Only this time, I'm definitely going to beat him. This school is so boring. All they do is talk nonsense and do nonsense things. Worse still, I feel like I can never escape them, as some of them live in the same neighborhood as me. But you know what the most annoying thing about my life is? That's Joy, my identical twin sister. In my parents' eyes, she's perfect. That's why she's the favorite child. Her allowance is more than mine, and she gets to attend an elite private school while I'm stuck at the most boring school ever. How unfair! With a sulky face, I walked into my room whining. I think having identical daughters means our parents forgot that there's actually two of us. They've never picked me up from school. Don't be absurd. They just took me to collect my dress for the school gala. <laughs> a new dress for some fancy party. How terrible for you. I don't even want to go to the party. Trust a nerd like you not to appreciate what you have. If I were you, I'd make the most of every second of that elite school of yours. And if I were you, I would just enjoy my pressure-free life. 
We both sighed and stared into a void, thinking about our tiring lives. Then Joy suddenly turned to me. Oh my god, Jade! Do you want to be me? Go to my school, have my things, and attend the gala? What a brilliant idea! Why had we never thought of it before? I'd live her fancy life and she'd live my doll one. That's perfect! Wow, this school is enormous. I tried to keep my cool as I navigated the endless hallways in search of Joy's locker. Ah, found it. I spotted a group of girls waving me over. They must be Joy's besties. Ruth, Nora, and Nell. Unlike my boring sister, they looked very glam in their branded clothes. What a power group. Wherever we went, all eyes were on us. Students handed us snacks, saved places in the cafeteria line for us, and let us sit in the front row of the basketball match. These girls were so interesting. Bet I fit in with them way more than Joy did. Talking about Joy, she somehow loved my boring old-fashioned school. I'd never heard her chat that much in my life. About how nice my friends were, how easy all the lessons were, and how cool the school bus was. Joy's friends were so much fun, and they did cool things. For instance, they always had shopping dates and bought each other expensive gifts without question. One time, Nora, the richest girl in the group, didn't hesitate in going into Kate's spade and buying the new release handbag for Ruth. I thought this was pretty awesome of Nora. But then, something happened that made me question the group dynamics. Ruth told me that she liked the red velvet cupcakes at the bakery near my house, and she asked me to buy her some. I was happy to do it, but the next day, when I brought the cupcakes and told her the price, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Joy, my dear, I don't care how much they cost. That's your concern. Then, she turned to Nora, showed her a picture of a cute but expensive skirt, and told her to order it for her. Hang on, had she always been thinking it was acceptable to order us around like this? I don't understand why an innocent bookworm like my sister would hang around with this cunning clique. They don't study at all. During the test, while I was still randomly circling the answer, Ruth kept on kicking my chair and urging me to let her copy my work. And as soon as the teacher turned her back on us, she even snatched my answer sheet. Huh? What's with that attitude? I took a look around and saw both Nora and Nell were also copying another girl's paper against her will. Rude! After the test, Ruth came up to me, hissing. Have you forgotten our deal? Huh? Deal? What could it be? Well, I guess I would have to put up with Ruth for as long as I was Joy, so I could return everything to her in roughly the same condition after the gala. What I really should do now is just to enjoy this elite school life, right? So, I didn't join Ruth and her minions for lunch, but bought food from this super cool vending machine instead. They even had pizza! But, the machine made these weird sounds. Ugh, I think my food was stuck. So I kicked and tapped it. But, it still didn't work! <laughs> you dare get into an altercation with the pizza machine? You must be starving. Oh. My. God. This basketball boy was the most handsome guy I'd ever seen in my life. I was too lost in his eyes to realize the dumb machine had finally delivered my lunch. This gorgeous guy then leaned towards me and my heart skipped. Oh Cupid, I wish I was the one he picked up instead of the pizza. Here you go. Right before I could react, someone snatched the tray and pushed me aside to enter between us. Thanks Hayden, wanna share lunch with me? Huh, excuse me? How could she steal both pizza and a boy from me? The boy took my pizza from her and said, Thanks, but I'd like to share this with this cute starving girl instead. I'll buy the drinks. Wait, was he asking me? Then yes, 100% yes! Leaving a furious Ruth behind us, we walked to the bench table nearby. So, he's Hayden, the captain of the basketball team. We talked so much about our favorite comic books and even played basketball for a bit before classes. That was my best lunch ever! After school, I was about to leave when Ruth stopped me. Didn't anyone ever tell you not to mingle with Hayden? He's not wealthy. We have high standards about who deserves to be around us. Duh! Huh? She sure seemed to swoon over him earlier, but now that he'd turned her down, she decided he wasn't worthy? This girl's mindset really didn't sit well with me. As soon as I arrived home, I told Joy everything. You should listen to Ruth. Hayden must be bad news. I don't care what Ruth thinks. How come you do? 
Is it because of this deal you have with her? <sighs> Not your business, but stay away from Hayden. I don't want to get in trouble. Ugh, this vague hints were agitating me. What was it about? But whatever the deal between Joy and Ruth was, I wasn't going to let it get in the way of my blossoming romance with Hayden. Today, me and Hayden had arranged to meet at lunch again to play basketball. I excitedly walked out of art class just as the girl fell and dropped her painting set around my feet. I immediately picked them up for her, when all of a sudden, a boy's hand covered mine right before someone stamped their feet on our hands. It was Ruth! It was her who tripped up the poor girl too. She did all that on purpose to hurt me, but Hayden got there just in time to save the day. What do you think you're doing? Feeling too embarrassed being caught red-handed, Ruth couldn't do anything but give me a spiteful look before leaving. I couldn't believe that Hayden did that for me. His hand was swollen, but he just kept checking if my hand was okay. How can Ruth be so horrible? Because she knows everyone's ugly secrets, and she uses them to control people. Joy, she knows your secret too, right? No. Uh, um, I'm not sure, but... I don't care. No matter what that secret is, she's gone too far. Don't worry, I got your back. So will I. Oh, I'm Katie, by the way. From then on, I no longer hung out with Ruth and her minions, but I kept quiet about this to Joy as I didn't want her freaking out and making us switch back places early. The more time I spent with Hayden, the more I found myself liking him. I wanted to confess to him who I really am, but I can't. At least not yet anyway. <sighs> Katie is really nice to me too, and she introduced me to her super sweet friends. Everything was just perfect, except my grades. Well, I didn't dare to tell Joy about this either. My study was pretty bad, and it literally ruined Joy's straight-A record. Meanwhile, Ruth, time after time, insisted that I was the one who had to do all her homework, research, and tests. But, duh, I couldn't even finish mine. You know what I've got. Yeah? What exactly is that you have? What's all the threat about? Ruth was stunned seeing me talking back at her like that. Yep, that was it. I've had enough. After class, she waited at my locker and signaled me to follow her to the equipment room. Finally, I could know what my secret was. Ruth showed me a video on her phone of Joy sneakily checking her notes during an examination. Was she cheating? If our principal sees this, I'm sure your precious scholarship will be long gone. And what about that excellent student title of yours? So Ruth was using this to manipulate Joy. Does she do the same to everyone else? Do you think this would scare me? I don't think. I know. You don't want to lose everything, right? <laughs> no, Ruth. It's you who's gonna lose. Do whatever you want with that clip, like I care. And so, I walked away, leaving a fuming Ruth behind. To be honest, I was a bit scared. Well, I know scores and things like academic transcripts were so important to Joy. What if I destroyed it all? After my last class of the day, the thing that I feared the most came upon me. The principal called me to her office and showed me the video that proved that I cheated on a math exam. She was so disappointed in my horrible grades recently, she even asked if it was because I was too caught up in my dating life and the bad influence I called friends. But how am I supposed to tell her that it was just my own incompetence? Nothing to do with Joy or Hayden or my new friends. I just reached my room door when I heard mom scolding Joy. The principal must have called her. It was all my fault. When mom left the room, I could feel how angry and frustrated mom was. Joy, I'm so sorry. I couldn't let Ruth have this hold over me. Um, I mean you anymore. I waited for Joy to take it out on me. But to my surprise, she was kind of happy. That's okay. I think I should thank you for that. I've never been brave enough to stand up for myself, although I was so tired of getting picked on all the time. I was so scared, but turns out being scolded by mom isn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> My homeroom teacher also called me, but she only gave me a warning and told me not to make the same mistake again. I've never felt this at ease before, Jade. I'm not the perfect Joy anymore. Then, Joy told me about the pressure she felt to be perfect. One time, she even got sick before the math test due to studying too much. Not having enough decent revision and being afraid of getting a bad grade, Joy cheated and was caught and recorded by Ruth as evidence. 
we finally understood each other and decided to teach Ruth a lesson to stop manipulating and taking advantage of others. We spied on Ruth and secretly recorded her. And guess what? Turned out she was not as wealthy as she always pretended to be. All the brand names she had were from the poor victims that she called friends. I also filmed Ruth forcing the top students to do homework and essays for the rich kids while she just sat idly to collect money. I was so ready to post these videos online, but Joy stopped me. She told me if we did this, we were just as bad as Ruth. Instead, she had a better idea. She sent the videos to Ruth and demanded her to delete all of the student's secrets. In exchange, we would delete all of hers. Ruth, of course, had no choice but to obey. Wow, how mature my sister is. My last day in Joy's life has arrived. I'm just gonna make the most of it before I hand the reins back to my sister. Honestly, I kinda miss my normal school and my friends. But what about Hayden? Will he still want to know me when he finds out I lied to him? I was looking around for Hayden when I saw some mean girls mocking Ruth for wearing a dress cheaper than theirs. So I walked straight up to them and whispered into their ears that I knew all their dirty secrets and they couldn't do anything else but storm off. Ruth gave me a coy look, mumbled a thank you, and then left. At that moment, a warm hand gently clasped mine. Hayden! Wow, you're so cool. I... I'm not that cool, Hayden. Actually, I am... I have something I have to tell you. I then told him everything. From how I swapped identities with my twin sister, to how I ruined her school life because of my childishness. You didn't ruin anything. Actually, you made things much better. So, since the pizza vending machine day till now, it has always been you, not Joy, right? Yeah, it's been me all along. <laughs> That's all I needed to know. Then he pulled me in for the best kiss ever. Seeing Chi acting shamelessly loving around Nam in front of Ronnie when she knew all the truth even irked her more. Can't underestimate this snake. What is she scheming? I'd better watch out on her. Later that day, while working near the kitchen, Veronica spotted Chi doing something fishy. Hey, what you doing? Nothing. Veronica immediately bent down to see a wrinkled food package in a bin nearby. What? The expiration date was 2023? A year ago? Hey, why do we still have expired food here? Oh gosh, but is it ice cream that room 302 asked for? Right away, Ronnie asked the staff to check all of the food orders and rushed after the food trolley which was set to arrive at room 302. The news was soon to reach Nam, so he sprinted to the guest room to see Ronnie was already there. Excuse me, miss. On behalf of the hotel, I do apologize for this inconvenience. It's on us for not training our staff well. I'll be talking to her now. Then he dragged Ronnie into the corner. You're ruining others' efforts due to your irresponsibility, don't you see? If you can't do it properly, then do nothing! His words were like thousands of daggers pierced into Ronnie's heart. Okay, now I got it. In his eyes, I was only that. Shallow. Suddenly, the guests came near them. Excuse me, I know you're teaching your staff and it's not my business to interfere, but this girl wasn't the one who delivered the food earlier. But she came here and sincerely apologized to me for what she didn't do, which is much appreciated. You should reward her instead. Hearing that, Ronnie couldn't hold her tears and ran away. Ronnie! Veronica! Sorry, I gotta go. Our manager will talk with you soon, and the hotel will offer some compensation for your trouble. Gosh, my anger got the better of me, and I hurt her once again. Where are you, Ronnie? I was too dumb to keep chasing after him like a fool, while he didn't bother to care, and even wanted to kick me out. Okay, fine. I'll go as you wish. In the blurred vision due to teary eyes, Ronnie spotted a smirk face of Chi, the one who's behind all of this. If it hadn't been for my brother and two families, I would expose you already, you snake! That night, Ronnie didn't want to face Nam at the hotel, so she ran to Hoi River for some fresh air, and in front of her eyes was Hoi An with a different charm. At night, when the dark covered everything, colorful lanterns were lit up, stretching the sparkling lights in every corner of the ancient town, but the splendid view didn't color her any happier. She was glumly dragging her feet on the sidewalk when she spotted an old woman sitting on the edge of a riverbank selling floating lanterns, and her hands were shaking when she was trying to light them up. Let. Me. Help. You. Okay? Then she sat down and helped her kindle the candles and deliver lanterns to buyers. Seeing their faces beaming with the flickering candle lights made Ronnie unconsciously smile. It's like everyone whistles their dreams in lanterns and has the river give wings to the wishes to fly high and far away.
Ronnie was immersed in her own thoughts when she accidentally burned herself. Are you okay? What? Ronnie, listen, I came to apologize to you for the misunderstanding this afternoon. I should have listened to you first. Let me help you. Don't frown like that, or you're gonna be some wrinkled old woman soon. Hey, hello, Earth to Veronica. All right, let me show you around. We only have tomorrow here before returning to Da Nang. You will regret it if you don't go. Come on, I beg you, okay? Veronica was still in a foul mood, but unknowingly stretched her hand. They said goodbye to the old lady and walked side by side along Hoi River, but no one said anything until, Are you gonna ignore me forever like that? You think I'm some annoying girl, don't you? Huh? Why you ask that? Um, no, maybe. Then why you had to hire a fake girlfriend just to avoid me? What? She knew it? But how? I, I... I'm sorry. It was the reason at first, but it turns out I was wrong about you. You have a good heart and don't deserve those things. Maybe it's too late, but I'm sorry again. I should have thought it through first. What makes you think of me like that? It's like years ago. You suddenly slammed a door in front of me without a word, and then now turned indifferent and hateful to me. Why, Nom? Something happened, and I'll tell you when time feels right. Please trust me. I never hate you and will never. Please tell me, what should I do for you to forgive me? I don't know, but maybe... Uh, Padalo, or here they call it Dap V, right? Yes, I want to try Dap V, but we're not done here. Okay, okay. The next day, Nam took Ronnie to Padalo as promised. Okay, Dap is riding, V is the duck. But wait, it's clearly a swan. Why? Um, I don't know either. Vietnamese is complicated. <laughs> Having tickets, two of them were waiting to be on boat, and Veronica couldn't hide her excitement. Okay, be careful! It's flippable! Poof! I'm not a kid! Then Ronnie excitedly jumped on the boat, causing it to sway from side to side, and it wobbled even more as she was being extremely panicked. Ah! I haven't watched Stranger Things Season 5 yet! I can't die now! Nom, save me! <laughs> I told you what! Now, take my hand! Ronnie slowly held out her hand, then Nam gently pulled her in his arms and helped her sit down. Do you feel okay now? No, I'm not okay at all. Hey, aren't you saying you want to do Padalo? Here you go. Ah, oh, that's right. Then they left the dock and started pedaling farther. Ronnie at first had some troubles in steering the boat, but with the help of Nam, she totally enjoyed this little game. It's just like riding a bike. Simple, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of an exercise, right? Then exercise more. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, they even raced against each other enthusiastically and went to the middle of the lake without knowing. Hey, why suddenly stop? <sighs> I feel my legs are going to leave me soon. Then suddenly, rain started pouring down and the boat started tottering. They looked around to find that the other boats had already returned to the dock, leaving theirs alone here. Oh my god, we had to pedal fast to the dock now! Hey, together! One, two, one, two... But the strong wind made the boat even more wobbly. Just wait here until the rain stops. What? I couldn't just wait here! Anyone? Help! Help! But Ronnie's attempt clearly turned in vain, as it only invited more people on the shore taking pictures and recording them. After a while, everything was quiet before Nam broke the silence. Do you still recall that day back in secondary school? We snuck outside to buy a new flavor of our favorite bubble tea. It was raining hard, just like today. <laughs> you still remember that? Right, that day we were soaked like rats, just to be chased by a dog, and we ended up dropping bubble teas on the road, and even got scolded by teachers. <laughs> <laughs> then the two of them kept talking about the good old moments together, without noticing the rain had abated since when. Soon after, the safeguard appeared to help them return to the dock. About Ronnie and Nam, they might get wet, but more than that, they were soaked in the fresh emotions towards each other. Nom, let's call today Duck Day. And on this day, June 6th, every year, we're gonna do Padalo again. Sounds fun. That night, someone uploaded photos of them on the lake on the internet. It naturally became the meme of the day and received thousands of reactions. <laughs> <laughs> Those comments are so funny. Nom, you read it? But not as funny as your face. Then every night after, they kept texting each other, and it was always dawn when they finally said goodnight. Is it too early to think about our firstborn child's name? <laughs> <sighs> no way Nam would do anything to harm my family, but what should I do to convince Grayson? I've been wrong about her all the time. It was stupid of me to project my hatred towards her mom to her. Seeing this, Grayson and Chi surely didn't take it well. 
Bay, what are we supposed to do now? Urgh, just one more step away. Early the next morning, Grayson met Ronnie for some negotiation. My baby sis, our plan needs your little help to be kicked off. No way I help you. Stop your silly crush. Do you really dare to betray your own family just for some jerk? Says you. I give you one week to find evidence, and now what you've got? Nothing, apart from some dirty tricks you pulled on Nom. Tell you what, I'm out. Grayson, what now? We don't need her. I have another plan. A few days later, Nam's hotel suddenly got back out at night. But it wasn't the only thing out of his expectation. Call technicals to check the grid now! Hey, you! Your boss here, right? Yes, ma'am. I apologize for the accident. It might just be some minor technical problems. Please come back to your room. The electricity will soon return. Patient? How could I be patient when your staff humiliated me? W what ma'am? Everything's turned pitch black and I was trying to find some receptionist. Here you are. Why cut the electricity without notice, huh? Please bring me a fan or something. I'm sweating like crazy. You're sweating not for being hot, but for you being overweight, miss. You're saying what? Are you deaf? I'm saying because you're fat, miss. So this is the way you train your staff? Right then, more and more customers came to confront Nam. Hey, some staff snuck into my room saying to fix some wire plugs, but he stole my wallet away. Me too. My laptop was stolen when the lights were out as well. Hotel what? It's a scam, guys. Nam was trying to calm the guests down, but they seemed not to be in a mood for any explanations. Instead, they asked to return the room and demanded a payback. How, how could this happen? Little did he know, the mastermind was already sneakily slipping through the crowd to run away. That's it. And now let's see how that jerk deals with this. Nam tried to track down the staff, but he was nowhere to be seen. The hotel was plunged into turmoil. Orders came in few, and the reputation was seriously in ruin. Ronnie couldn't bear seeing that. It's definitely Grayson who's behind all of this. He's my brother, but he's wrong this time. Even if it's true Nam wanted to harm our family, there's many other ways to confront this. And she meant it. She came straight to find Grayson. It's you, right? What are you talking about? Don't act innocent. It's you who set up the Noms Hotel incident. Yes, it's me. So what? This little brat has no skills in running business anyway. I just helped him realize it sooner. You have to admit this and return the prestige to Noms Hotel. Huh? Are you dreaming, my little sis? Oh no, my big bro. I'm sorry to tell you that actually, I've already recorded our conversation. If you have no guts to admit, then let your little sis do it. I, hey, I don't know anything about this. Don't drag me into this. Bye! Wh why do you do this? I'm your brother! That's why I want you to understand we couldn't take revenge by revenge. Jesus, did that jerk cast a spell on you or what? Why now you still blindly trust him? It's him who made our resorts stumble. Then Nam out of the blue barged in. Who told you I harmed your family? Here you are. If not you, then who else? Isn't it you who did this to take revenge for... Keep talking. Why stop? Take revenge for what? I've already turned a blind eye and let this slide. And now you want to dig this up? Okay, fine. That's when Ronnie knew all the truth about her mom scheming on taking Nam's family's resort for her own possession. That's also the reason why that day he coldly left her without a word. N my mom? So my dad was also in on that? No, your dad is totally oblivious about that. Mr. Andrews was so kind to help us with a handsome sum to start again. He's been so nice to us, so I don't want to make a fuss. And you've known about this the whole time, but still talk about revenging? Don't you see our family is the one who should take the blame? Grayson, it's the karma we have to take. I'm so disappointed in you and mom. No, I'm, I do apologize to you for all the troubles my family has caused you and your family. I will handle this ASAP. Then Veronica asked Grayson to publicly admit his scheme and apologize to Nam. This wasn't easy for Grayson, but I know deep down, my brother isn't a bad person. Thanks to that, Nam's hotel resumed working smoothly as before. After that, Ronnie and her brother came back to the States and told the truth to their dad. What? You've been doing this behind my back the whole time? You know what? We're more brothers to each other. When I had nothing, it's him who helped to lift me up, and now you were quite evil with good? Mrs. Andrews was perplexed, as this was the first time she saw her husband this mad. She admitted her wrongdoings, and a few days later suggested they come back to Vietnam to apologize to Nam's family. And of course, they couldn't believe in what they were just told. They kept silent for a while, then... To be honest, this news is totally strange to me. But it's all the past now. Let's end here once and for all. And after everything, the siblings finally found themselves on the same side in the matter. I was about to tell you before, but not until now do I have courage. 
But thank you, Ronnie. You might not believe it. If it hadn't been you and the recording, I might not have been able to awake from the nightmare of revenge and then admit my wrongdoings. I was foolish to let hatred and jealousy cloud my judgments and act silly. But thanks to Nam's big heart and your righteousness, I now learn my own lessons. And hey, he might be a good brother-in-law, sis. How could it happen when our families and me alone caused too many troubles to his family and him? Two years later, now Veronica's worked for her family business as Grayson's assistant. One day, when going back to home after a tiring working day, she got a message from a strange number. What's this? This is creepy. Anyways, today is June 6th, so what? Oh my, is it... Veronica hurriedly outside to see Nam already there, holding a big bouquet. Ready? Hmm, ready. Why you suddenly... Ah, oh, no. See, what takes you so long? Oh, pardon me, princess. It's hard to find a pedalo, uh, a true Dap V in the States. Aha! A snowstorm's coming! Perfect for a race. Let's go, my loyal soldiers! Looks like a big storm, guys. Shall we head home? Scared already? Cowards! I was born and raised in the snow. This is nothing. Then I signaled for Bam and Holly to speed up, but they stopped and barked nonstop instead. Is that pile of snow moving? I hurriedly ran over to check. OMG! It's a boy! No, an angel with blonde hair. My heart was racing. Is this love at first sight? H help me. No matter how much Eldon and Era objected, I insisted on bringing this guy back to my place. I had to take care of him myself. Oh, looks like he'd woken up. Are you okay? Where am I? You're in my house. I'm Brenna, by the way. I found- Oh, God. Huh? What's wrong? Something on my face? Um, no. It's just that you're too beautiful. Like a real-life Snow White. Then he said his name's Beavis. He came here to travel, but unfortunately was met by the snowstorm. Yeah, it's gonna snow heavily in the next couple of days, so you should stay here until you recover. After a few days, Beavis got better, so I showed him around. On the sledge. Although Bam and Holly were practically just walking, Beavis still freaked out so much, he huddled up against me. <laughs> Hold on tight! I'm speeding up! We went up a hill, then through a pine forest and arrived at, ta-da, probably the biggest frozen lake he had ever seen. I taught Beavis how to drill a hole in the ice, then he excitedly dropped the fishing line. The following days, I continued taking him sightseeing, and we were basically inseparable. We went to see polar bears kayaking among the icebergs. I taught him how to make instant snow by spraying boiling water into the cold air, and we even watched the spectacular auroras together. Wow, I've never seen such beautiful scenery before. Yeah, and I'd never seen such a beautiful face before. Just like that, Beavis spent day after another with me here in the Arctic. It's been so much fun, but for some reason, my friends Eldon and Era were not having any of it. They seemed to hold grudges against him or something. One time when I was arranging supplies in the root cellar, I heard Beavis's ear-piercing scream. I hurriedly checked and saw a white fox dashing out, followed by giggles outside the window. You're such a chicken, big city boy. It's just an extra-large kitty. Then Eldon and Era burst into laughter. Ugh, can those two show a little hospitality? At dinner, I cooked him my signature dish as an apology to Beavis for those naughty friends of mine. He was totally cool about it and even told me stories about his friends back at home and about their lives in Florida. Whoa, it sounds so magical. I wish I could lounge around on a beach and soak up the sun while enjoying my coconut drink too. I went to sleep dreaming about the beautiful urban life. Suddenly, a knock on my bedroom door woke me up. I stumbled to answer it and saw Beavis. Hey, Brenna, could you take me to the toilet? It's too dark outside, and that fox might come back. <laughs> How cute! He's really good at coming up with excuses to be with me. W while waiting for Beavis, I planned out what we're going to do tomorrow. As he got back from the outhouse, ooh, I couldn't contain my excitement and told him right away. Uh, <clears throat> hey, I'm all better now. Maybe it's time for me to go home. Huh? Why so sudden? I'm sorry, but I really can't take this anymore. No, how can my first love end this fast? It hasn't even started. Brenna, it's so tough for me to live here. I don't want to boil ice every time I need a cup of water or go to the toilet out in the freezing cold. And how tiring that we can only go around on sleds. But even if we had a car, there's literally nowhere to go in this gloomy place. 
But still, I've endured it all this whole time because I can't leave you. I think I'm in love with you. Beavis, I- How about you going to the city with me so that we could stay together? Oh my, it turned out that we both have feelings for each other, but because of that, he had to suffer in silence. Such a sweet guy. And it's true, he wasn't built for this harsh climate. He didn't belong here. The next morning, I told Eldon and Ira that I wanted to hang out in Miami for some days. Rana, I don't think it's a good idea. That pansy boy must have coaxed you to do this. Don't buy those sweet words. I tried my best to explain how nice and polite Beavis was, but they wouldn't listen. Girl, he got you all blinded. You've only known him for a few days, not enough to tell what kind of person he is. Can't believe you're just one of those shallow girls. Who are you calling shallow? Yeah, right. I was blinded. Blinded by his kindness. Then I stormed off, leaving Eldon and Ira behind. I just worry about you. Yeah, right. Worry? Or are you just jealous of me? I came home to a shivering Beavis. He couldn't stand this freezing weather anymore, and I couldn't bear seeing him like this either. So I told Beavis that I would go with him. Look how happy Beavis was, and I too was excited to visit his hometown. It's gonna be fun. It took only less than two days for us to arrange things out, buy the tickets, ask Era to look after Bam and Holly, and we're good to go. After a long flight, we're finally here. It looks like a completely different world in front of my eyes. Crowds of people rushing left and right. Suddenly, I spotted something. Oh, that looks just like my Holly. What a spoiled husky. At that age, my two buddies were already the best sled dogs in the area. Oopsie. City folks don't seem too friendly, do they? Huh? What else? Why is it moving so fast and nonstop? While I hesitated to take a step, Beavis suddenly carried me up in the air. Don't worry, I got you. Oh boy, he's so sweet. Beavis then got me transformed into a city girl. He took me shopping, then got my hair dyed. I really like my silky black hair, but Beavis said this looked better on me. This too, baby girl. This is a tattoo parlor, isn't it? Seeing my confusion, Beavis explained that couples here usually get tattooed on important occasions, and today marks the first day that you walk into my world, so I want it imprinted in my heart. So Beavis and I got matching tattoos that he chose, a weird-looking red shape behind the ears. It might not look pretty, but was definitely unique enough to be special for just us two. Once we were done shopping, we went to a luxurious villa. Oh my, is he taking me to his parents? I'm so nervous, not sure how I should behave when Beavis comforted me. They were nice, don't worry, just do as they tell you to. Just then, the main door opened. Everyone turned to look at us full of excitement. This must be the first time Beavis took his girlfriend home then. Uh, hello, hello everyone. I... Suddenly a man walked straight over and lifted my chin. Very similar, but... But this, but that. Just look at her birthmark. It's Demi. Thank, Thank goodness. goodness. Our, Our beloved, beloved daughter, daughter has, has returned. returned. I was still processing everything when everyone rushed to hug me and bombarded me with questions. I turned to Beavis for help, but where is he? What's going on? I tried to explain that I was Brenna, born in the snowy Arctic. Both my parents had passed away and this was my first time leaving my hometown, but to no avail. My precious daughter, Beavis told us everything. You fell in the woods and had a concussion, so you're having a temporary memory loss. Just get rested for now, okay? Oh, where is Beavis then? I gotta ask him something. Don't worry, your savior will be well rewarded. You'll see him tomorrow. <sighs> everything happens so fast, I'm totally lost. But the most I could do now is to wait until tomorrow. I'm sure Beavis will clear things up. Upon catching sight of Beavis, I immediately unloaded it all onto him. Shush, just listen to me first. Turned out, Beavis worked here for the Atchley's family. He escorted their daughter, Demi, on a trip to the mountains, but she ran away. Mrs. Atchley was utterly furious about this and used his ill mother to blackmail him into finding Demi. That's why he risked going out into the snowstorm where we met. But why me? I have nothing to do with Demi. You and Demi look just like twins. <gasps> when I saw you, I couldn't believe my eyes either. I did what I did because I was worried for my mom. I hope you can forgive me and help us, please. I'll soon find Demi. So, you were only using me? No, I'm truly in love with you, Brenna. I didn't want to be away from you, and you deserve a much better life here, with me. But... Just wait until I find Demi, then we will run away and live happily together. Poor Beavis. He seriously had the worst luck. If I were him, I guess I would do the same. So, I reluctantly lived as Demi. Luckily, her parents thought I lost my memory, which made it not too hard to be her. One day, I received a text from Eldon. I suddenly remembered that I'd been away from home for almost a month. 
I wonder if Bam and Holly miss me. To say I was not one bit homesick would be a lie. But there's no way I'd speak to Alden, so I called Era to catch up on things and asked for her help in the search for Demi. It had been a few days already, but neither Era nor Bee had heard anything about Demi. Feeling too restless, I went for a walk in the garden. Wait, what's that noise? Alden? See what you got yourself into, idiot? Told ya, I saw right through him. Why are you here? And what are you talking about? Era already told me. Beavis obviously only sees you as someone else's replacement. He doesn't love you. Let's go home. No, let me go. Stop bothering my girl. Leave me alone, please. You're only making things worse. This place has everything and is much better than a hellhole in the middle of nowhere. Live there all you want. Don't drag me down with you. Eldon immediately let my hand go. He didn't say another word, but gave me a disappointed look. Was that too much? Well, he's the one who kept sticking his nose in others' business. Who is he to control me? After that day, I still saw him lurking around the mansion sometimes. So annoying. Who in their right mind would be out in this scorching heat? Today, Mom, I mean Mrs. Ashley, suddenly took me shopping. I guess having a family like this isn't too bad, huh? She said tonight I was attending an important dinner party, so I had to put on this tight dress along with a pair of killer heels. They looked pretty good, but I really couldn't breathe. Jeez, how can anyone do this? It's literally harder than walking on thin ice. Ah! Phew, that was close. Thank you, sir. I- Careful, I can't be around to protect you all the time. Alden, why is he still so kind to me? I wanted to say something to him, but Mom already signaled for me to hurry up from afar. I rushed to the car, leaving him there. Thanks to Mom's preparation, the guys there were staring at me without blinking, especially the special guest. Mom told me that I was supposed to be smiley and friendly to Otis, but how was I supposed to do that when he kept rambling all these boring stories? My eyes wandered around, searching for Beavis and an excuse to leave. What are you looking for, sweetie? The most important person is already right in front of you. Ugh! I pushed him away, then ran off. Ah, there are Beavis is. We should get out of this boring place. Oh, Mrs. Ashley's here too? What? That's it? I risk being in danger just to find her and bring her back to you. Don't take me for a fool. I'm only her stepmother, but I can tell that girl isn't Demi. I just let you off since she resembled her quite a bit. You're in no position to demand. But didn't you get Otis all smitten also? Isn't that all you care about anyway? So give me my money. I had to rack my brain to sweet talk that girl into coming here. That means your sickly mother doesn't exist either, does she? Oh, sweet, you've heard it all. So what if that's true? You won't get a dime. I'll expose your scheme. Where are you going, sweetheart? It's bedtime. So my phone was confiscated and I'd been locked in this room for three days straight. They wanted me to give in and date Otis, but no way. I tried every possible way to escape, but always ended up getting caught. One morning, I was woken up by dogs barking. Annoyed, I went to the balcony to check and saw Alden and Bam. Eldon signaled for me to stay calm and flew a paper plane to me, then swiftly left. Let's see. <gasps> Fine then, if that's what he wants. Let's end things here once and for all. I agreed to date Otis like the Ashleys demanded. I even enthusiastically chose my own outfit, did my makeup with a cute hairstyle. Mr. and Mrs. Ashley were very pleased with that. They couldn't hide their excitement and even stood at the gate to welcome Otis when he came to pick me up. As his supercar arrived, Otis, the preppy guy, had just stepped out when Eldon signaled Bam to charge at him and scared him away. Meanwhile, the Ashleys were screaming for security. I was gonna leave in the midst of the chaos, but... Don't you dare run away! Ugh! Holly jumped out of nowhere and made Beavis fall to his knees. Holly then bit on his pants and dragged him around. Good job, baby! Right then, a car stopped in front of us and a girl stepped out who looked just like me. <gasps> this must be Demi! Who are you? Why do you look exactly like my daughter? What kind of father are you to not recognize your own child? This is precisely why I ran away from home. After that, Demi exposed her stepmother and Beavis's evil plan in my stead. Demi's dad frantically apologized to his daughter and admitted that he'd always been so caught up with work that he overlooked family and his wife's scheme. Get out of my sight at once and don't even think about bringing a dime with you. Then Eldon dragged me into the car and in the driver's seat was... Era! Thank you, Ira. Just me? Eldon did most of it. I shyly looked over at Eldon. Thank you, and I'm sorry. It's okay, we're friends after all. I'll take care of you at all costs. Um, uh, anyway, just hope that you've learned your lesson now, Brunna. Not all that glitters is gold. 
Eldon's right. This beautiful city is glamorous, but I don't belong here. I belong to the wind and snow, to the winterland I call home. Time to go back. The trip to the city was like a fever dream, but let's leave it all behind, cause I'm busy racing with Eldon. As expected, he's always as slow as a turtle. Hi, this is for you. For me? What's the occasion? The day we stop being friends. Brenna, what do you say if we become more than friends? Finally, back in my natural habitat. Now these city kids could see what I'm capable of. Behold, my big, beautiful flame. They were in awe of my skill. When suddenly, the fun was put to an end by some overreacting teachers. They started yelling at me, saying there's a rule against fire. Ugh, how could you call this a campsite if campfire is not even allowed? Fire making is an essential survival skill, y'all. These boring city people don't know a thing. Who needs all their rules anyway? I know I don't. Hi, I'm Nova, the fire hazard. And I didn't always live in the city. I spent the first 14 years of my life on the road. Our family used to travel the country in our RV. We never stayed any place more than a couple of months. We foraged for food and slept under the stars. But my world was flipped upside down when my parents decided to divorce. My mom wanted to settle down and my dad would continue life on the road. I begged to go with dad, but mom had custody of me. I'd love to stay with you, my little birdie, but I have to go. No cage can hold me for too long. At that moment, I promised myself I would break free and spread my wings too. My mom and I then settled into a small two-bedroom apartment in Savannah, Georgia, where we were greeted by our neighbors, Brenda Foster, a middle school teacher, and her son, Scott, who I'd soon be attending school with. Mrs. Foster was really friendly, but from the moment I met Scott, I knew we wouldn't get along. City people were always grumpy and glued to their cell phones. Mom had to work two jobs just to make ends meet. Accountant by day, Burger King employee by night. Her colorful wardrobe was replaced with dull uniforms, and all we ate now was fast food. I still kept a sheer hope that one day, when Mom makes enough money, we will hit the road again soon, but... No, this is going to be our forever home. Things might be hard for you at first, but trust me, it'll be good for you in the long run. That sounds like she wants my life to be this boring and stuffy for all eternity. Then came school. There were tons of rules, and every moment of our day was scheduled. In just one morning, I got in trouble for going to the bathroom and for eating my lunch. And on top of that, every teacher complained about my penmanship and spelling. But things were worse when I was among other kids. I could hear their whispers everywhere I went. One girl even came up to me and asked why I wore weird hippie clothes. My clothes aren't weird, you are. Even when some of them invited me to sit with them at lunch, I felt like an outsider. Anyone down for some pink drinks after school? Not me, I'm saving up for the era's tour. Count me in, I'm entering my pink girl era. None of these words they say makes any sense to me. Finally, they asked about my old life. Well, we didn't have to eat this junk. We can get fresh vegetables by the road. And I know how to skin road kills. And every day we tried many different fruits and fungi. But be careful, a simple mushroom could kill you. But by that point, I noticed they were either speechless or as pale as a ghost. Did I say something wrong? Every school day was a blur of confusing subjects. But today was my first music lesson, and I was so excited to finally do something I was good at. When the music teacher, Mr. Shapiro, asked if anyone wanted to perform for the class, I sprung up from my seat, ready to go. I confidently sang my favorite song, but halfway through, Mr. Shapiro interrupted me. We're learning classical music. That style is called reggae, which we don't teach here. <laughs> Nova's a hippy-dippy weirdo. The whole class erupted into laughter. What did I do? Ugh! Scott! I was so gonna give him a taste of my rosewood guitar, but everyone held me back. In the end, Mr. Shapiro said he'd be talking with our moms after school. Scott and his mom had already left before my mom came. Mr. Shapiro told her that I was a violent hothead who always dressed inappropriately. I waited for my mom to defend me, but she simply apologized. I'll talk to her about this later. Please excuse her behavior. She has never been to school before. Who was this woman and what had she done to my mother? Later, I told my mom how terrible school was, the constant staring and teasing, the way that everyone seemed to be a little afraid of me. Contrary to my expectations, she told me I should try harder to blend in, and she even had bought me normal clothes for school. Mom, clothes are my self-expression. I'm not changing just to fit in. What happened to you? Didn't you teach me to be myself? I did, but now I need you to blend in so you can make friends. I... 
I had to leave before bursting into tears. I couldn't stay in the stuffy apartment any longer. So I went out the window, climbed down the fire escape, and just ran away. But at one point, I realized I didn't know where to go. So I wandered around until I bumped into the Fosters, who insisted on walking me back home. Strangely, Scott seemed less annoying now, and kept looking awkwardly at me the whole way home. My mom was clearly surprised to see me when she opened the door. I felt like a joke, because she hasn't even noticed my rebellious great escape. I couldn't sleep that night. After thinking it over, I came to the conclusion that I could get my old life back if I found my dad. If only I knew how. The next morning at school, I went looking for the tools I needed to find my dad. Compass, flashlight, map. Scott? What are you up to in there? You first. I wanted to apologize for what happened in music class yesterday. Your turn. I'm gathering what I need to go find my dad, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Stop you? It looks like you need help. Those things may have helped you hundreds of years ago, but these days we just use the internet. I didn't want Scott's help, but maybe he was right. I had no clue where to start, and I could hardly even figure out how to use my cell phone. <sighs> maybe I need a little help to learn about the internet. Follow me. Scott spent that afternoon teaching me the basics of the internet. He also asked about my old life, and I found myself telling him everything. All the things I missed and hated about this new life. To my surprise, he was understanding. His mother was a single mom too, and it had been years since he heard from his father. After that day, I thought I hated him a bit less. About a week later, I felt like I was ready to start my search. Little did I know, googling my dad's name would give me literally millions of results. I was about to give up when I saw some people looking for their dogs. Hmm, that just gave me an idea. I printed as many flyers as the library would allow, and spent the next day putting them up around the neighborhood. I was surprised by a strange phone number. Hello? Yeah, hi. I just saw a clueless hippie wandering around and I think they matched the description you provided. I was over the moon by how quick I got a response. But then I saw Scott, half a block away, grinning at me with a cell phone in his hand. That internet thing you taught me is useless. Finding people is not that fast, even with the internet. Your best bet would be the database at the police station. Are you sure you... I didn't need to hear any more words and immediately flagged down a police car passing by. Over here, officer! The officer pulled over and rolled down his window. Morning, sir. Please take us to the station. What are you kids doing? Where are your parents? Well, I'm looking for my dad. I heard the officer speak into his intercom, saying he was bringing a lost child back to the station. Well, that's not what I meant, but whatever does the job, I guess. As he led me into the back of the car, I remembered. Sir, he's with me. Should we bring him too? Correction, two lost kids. Scott was obviously stunned as the police officer escorted us into his car. It's hilarious! <laughs> of course, I need my sidekick with me to help me find that database thingy. Shortly after arriving at the station, the officer left the room to get us some water. As soon as the door closed behind him, I sprung into action. I had to look in every corner, but Scott wasn't helping. Come help me! Where could that database thingy be in this room? What? No, dummy, it's in here. Then he jumped to the computer and did some clicking. Type your dad's name here. Keep an eye out. In an instant, a file with my dad's info came up. I printed it out and sprinted home before the ink could dry. My heart was pounding as I dialed my dad's number. Hey, yo! Dad, it's so good to hear your voice. Uh, who is this? It's me, Dad! Complete silence on the other end. Did I call the wrong number? It's me? Nova? Nova! Glad to hear from you. Guess what, kid? I've been up to all kinds of adventures. Then he talked to me about his amazing trips that I would have loved to be on. Then I asked where he was so I could go find him. I live in the moment, my little birdie. I go where the road takes me. Please, Dad, let me tag along. Okay, meet me at the exit of the interstate at 10 p.m. tomorrow. He ended the call before I could say anything else. I felt the sudden urge to cry for some reason. They must be happy tears. I was finally seeing my dad again. But how could I get there? Maybe my sidekick Scott could help me. If he had made it back from the police station. Oopsies! I ran to Scott's apartment, and to my surprise, he answered the door. Hey, how did you get home? Once I explained to the officer that you were just a little eccentric, he let me go. I'm sorry I left you there. I wasn't really thinking. Oh, I spoke to my dad, and he's picking me up tomorrow night. So, I need your help to get to the highway. The highway? What kind of parent asks his 14-year-old to meet him at the highway at night? Did he even ask you how you were doing? Or your mom? He clearly doesn't care at all. Wait, yeah, he really didn't ask. But dad probably was just busy. We can talk all about it tomorrow when we meet anyway. How dare Scott think ill of him? What do you know about my dad? 
He's a free spirit, and I should be traveling with him. Life's all about being spontaneous. My mom doesn't even understand it anymore, so I don't expect you to. But if you don't want to help me, fine. I'll figure it out myself. Then I stormed off. The night after, I was struggling with Google Maps. My phone was suddenly snatched out of my hand. I'll take you there. You might get lost if you go alone. I was still a little upset about yesterday, but that was nice of him. Plus, Scott was right. I would get lost on my own. We arrived early and waited. The hours dragged by, so I called Dad several times, but no answer. When I saw it was past 11 p.m., my call finally came through. Oh, man. You were there now? Our bus passed Savannah a while ago. <laughs> we're having a grand party. You should see. Oh, well, maybe we'll cross paths again soon. Bye, little birdie. He hung up right away. I noticed Scott watched me for a reaction, but I couldn't hold it in and burst into tears. Scott got us on the bus to go home. I was sobbing the entire way and couldn't talk through all the tears. Eventually, Scott spoke up. When my parents divorced, I spent a lot of time being mad at my mom, too. I couldn't understand why she didn't make my dad stay. But she did try to, right? Nope. She just accepted it. And I eventually realized that she wasn't weak like I had thought. She chose to stay to make sure my life was normal. Leaving would have been easy. And what she did, keeping the lights on, actually took a lot more strength. What Scott said sounded surprisingly mature. After that, we sat in silence for a while. I understood what Scott was saying, but I didn't think it applied to my case. My mom was just not the person she used to be. We arrived home very late. Before we parted, Scott said, Why don't you ask your mom why she decided to settle down here? Kids don't always understand why parents do certain things. Maybe you should hear her out. I nodded and took a deep breath before opening the door. My mom was on the phone with the cops, and as soon as she saw me, she ran to give me the biggest hug I had gotten in a long time. She asked me where I'd been, and I told her everything. How I tried to find Dad, how he stood me up, and things Scott said earlier. She listened to me attentively, then said what Dad did was terrible, but not exactly out of character. You know how we stopped by a town from time to time? Working temporary jobs like waiting tables and washing cars, right? What you didn't know is that your father always messed up and got fired a few days after he started. So he decided that he'd look after you while I worked. I didn't realize how hard Mom had always been working while me and Dad were just carelessly having fun. Then I asked why she chose that life in the first place. When I met him, I was working a 9-to-5 job that I hated. While your dad was all about, the world is a book, traveling makes you a storyteller. Of course, that sounded fascinating. So I quit my job and set myself free on the RV we bought. But why did you decide to settle down after all these years? After having you, I realized our wandering life wasn't a good environment for a kid. I was worried you'd have a hard time once you got older especially because your dad wasn't being helpful and was only being a bad example for you. Besides, homeschooling is difficult. We aren't teachers. You deserve to grow up in a stable home, have friends your age, and create deep connections with them. I got you two, and... and people we met from all over the country. But not enough, honey. I thought I should give you a normal life while you're still young. You'll be better prepared to make your own decisions later as an adult. It was unfair to you. Because you didn't choose that life. We did. The resentment I had towards my mom melted away. In its place was a profound gratitude for all that she sacrificed. I wasn't good with words, so I told her that the best way I could. Do you miss our old life? Well, yes. But for now, you're my number one priority. After the hurt's gone, it was time to heal. I tried to focus on my lessons and learn the rules. My mom even helped me pick out clothes that were more appropriate for school, but still felt like me. I tried my best to enjoy the same movies as other kids and learned to play their favorite songs on my guitar. Soon enough, they became my new friends. I continued to grow even closer to Scott, my friend and partner in crime, from the start. Still, my mom and I agreed that we shouldn't totally abandon our love for travel, and she promised that we would plan a few big road trips every year, starting this summer. I can hardly wait for our trip to Niagara Falls with Mrs. Foster and Scott. My precious Sunday is ruined because of my not-so-precious sister, Emma, who insisted on dragging me to church for some sister time. We walked in to see the priest rushing over. Welcome in. You must be our new member, Janet. W whoa whoa just then, the holy statues nearby all fell over and shattered to pieces. It's a bad omen. She's a jinx. No, no, no! You devil! Get out of here! Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. 
Hi, my name's Janet. If you think I'm a jinx too, you're seriously wrong. Because animators were wind that last scene. Pause it right there and... See that? That's my sister, Emma. And fast forward a bit more. Pan over, please. There. That right there is the ringmaster behind my so-called bad luck. You must be wondering why I hadn't exposed Emma that day. It's because everyone is fooled by her naive Cinderella look and never believed how a living angel could do such mischievous deeds. But the truth is, she's the devil. She did everything to make me look like a walking disaster everywhere I go. But who am I, huh? That night, to get back at Emma, I hid under the bed till she was sound asleep, wrapped my icy cold hands around her ankles, jumped out from under the bed, and BOO! Emma screamed through the roof, and our parents walked into the room worried just to see me laughing hysterically. Right then, the police on patrol also barged in, thinking something real wrong went on in our house. We ended up spending the night trying to explain to them nothing happened, and they finally left. Do you know how many sleepless nights we've had just because of you girls' petty fights? That's it. I'm signing you both up to join a community farm from tomorrow. What? But Dad, I can't live amongst animals and dirt. For once, I agree with Emma. There's no way I'm going there. You're not going back till you learn to live with each other. Living with Emma 24-7? I'd much rather be the jinx now. So the next morning, Mom and Dad drove us to the farm to live off the land and bond together. But look at this tranquility and picturesque scenery. Maybe coming here wasn't such a bad idea after all. Suddenly, a loud obnoxious track started playing from inside my suitcase, startling the animals, and they went rogue. Stop the music! But my suitcase was locked. I caught Emma smirking, pressing her phone, and the music suddenly stopped. Once everything was under control, the farmers gave me looks of disapproval. Just when I thought things couldn't be any worse, a trailer nearby slipped off and began to roll downhill, heading straight for an oblivious farmer. Emma immediately swooped in and pushed herself and the farmer out of harm's way just in the nick of time. Richard, are you okay? Oh, yes, thanks to this young lady. You saved my life. What a good luck charm you are. That trailer has been sitting there for ages without any problems. Why did it suddenly break just now? Oh, it's my sister. She has this reputation for bringing bad luck wherever she goes. I apologize on her behalf. No, 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 no. Don't listen to her. She's evil. That's not something you should say to your sister. Look at her. What an angel. Emma immediately activated her manipulating power. Aww. Come on. We got the nicest room for you. <laughs> hey, what about me? The next morning, I was told to milk the cows while Emma didn't even have to lift a finger, just wandering around and pulling pranks on me. In a panic, a guy appeared and helped me out. What happened here? The hoses are all snipped off. I'm so sorry about that. It's my sister's stupid prank to get me to look like bad luck. Interesting. Oh well, we'll hand milk the cows until we get them replaced. Hand milk? That'd take forever. Emma's gonna have to pay. Hey, no need for that. I'll give you a hand. I'm Kai, by the way. He gave the brightest smile, and I instantly felt better. I'm Janet. Thanks for helping me, but which buttons do I push to get milk? Kai cracked up, and I felt like the dumbest thing in the world. I'm sorry, but that was so cute. Okay, you don't push any buttons. You squeeze it, like this. Just then, Sylvia walked by and saw us. Well, well, well. Who makes you smile like that, Kai? Janet, you are really something, huh? As she left, I felt my heart racing and saw Kai blushing also. Whew, it sure feels hot like summertime. So, Kai, how long have you been living here? Just recently. I'm actually a skier from the city too, but I came here due to some stuff. Come on, let's go sell the milk. Kai and I then made our way to the bustling market. Surprisingly, customers were eager to get their hands on our milk. I was ready to make my first hard-earned cash when suddenly... <clears throat> you'd better watch out. You'd better not buy, better not drink this milk right here. Jinxy Janet's coming to town. The crowd buzzed with concern over our milk. Actually, I thought someone else was a jinx. You see, our milk is especially fresh today. All thanks to my good luck charm, Janet. She and I worked all morning to milk the cows by hand. Thanks to Kai's words, the crowd was excited again. Just like that, we sold out in just a few hours. Woohoo!
But when we got home, people started praising Emma for bringing good luck to the business. Actually, it was Kai and me who milked the cows, and more thanks to Kai who did most of the heavy lifting. She has nothing to do with this. The room suddenly felt awkward and people started to look away. Only Sylvia cared to acknowledge us. I see. You two make a great team. What about us? I think we'll make a better team. Get off of me, you creep. Ouch. Feisty. Oh my gosh, are you okay? Why are you acting like such an animal, Janet? I'm alright. She may be a bit cold right now, but she'll warm up to me in no time. Right, princess? Emma immediately gave me a death stare. Aiden, why are you here? I'm here for you, brother dearest. Mom and Dad are worried sick back home. Holy cow, these two are related, but they're nothing alike. Welp, it does explain why their tension was scorching up the room. Stop it, you two. Always with the bickering. It's getting late. Janet, will you go and lock the barn door? Oh, oh yes, definitely. But before I reached the barn, a hand suddenly pulled me back. Keep your claws off of Aiden. He's mine. Oh, I see. You're smitten with him, huh? Well, too bad, because he seems to like me instead, sister. How dare you? Emma dashed ahead of me towards the barn, turned all the lights on, blew on the deafening whistle, and the sheep went wild again. I desperately tried to stop the panic herd, but no use. Only when the farmer showed up and let the shepherd dog do his job was the scene under control. This is all your fault. You'll bring us nothing but bad luck and chaos. That's not true. I was trying to help while this was Emma's doing. Stop with all the blaming and start learning some manners, will you? <laughs> I was stunned. Behind Richard, Emma grinned slyly. She won this time, but not for long. Because how about I steal Emma's crush, aka Aiden, right in front of her? <laughs> well, actually, I didn't really have to steal anything. Because Aiden always found his way to me first. And he also brought Kai along. It was like something was going on between them. And they kept fighting to get my attention. They showered me with food, fought over the seat next to me at dinner, and wouldn't let me lift anything remotely heavy. It was getting a little annoying. But seeing Emma fuming with jealousy each time is so worth it. <laughs> One afternoon, Kai and I were picking flowers in the field when he gently tucked a flower in my hair. It looks good on you. Then, he lifted my face and leaned in closer. I was floating in the summer breeze, ready for a kiss, when we both got shaken up by the engine revving. Aiden? So pretty thing. Wanna go out with a date with me? She's with me. Can't you see? Well, maybe I'm blinded. Blinded by my love for you. Um, how about you two can show some brotherly love and go together, huh? Then I walked off, only to see Emma's blonde head sticking out from the flowers. Hey Aiden, on second thought, I'd love to go with you, shall we? Driving away, I could see Emma furious, and Kai, with sad eyes following me? But the thing was, this was hella awkward. I don't feel like flirting if there was no Emma, and he, well, I don't know, couldn't stand it anymore. So I told him to stop at this random clothing store and insisted he try on this fancy suit. Whoa, you cleaned up nicely, huh? Do I not look good usually? Well, you kinda look like a hooligan. <laughs> Is that genuine joy I see on your face? What? I'm always smiling. Oh, really? You and Kai were ready to bite each other's heads off just then. You don't know everything about us, Janet. I know you have a thing for him, but I can never let you two be together. Not this time. We came back to the farm to see Emma waiting for us, all agitated. You tramp! Isn't Kai enough for you? Now you're playing the double game with Aiden? And you're just jealous because Aiden doesn't like you. That's right. I only have eyes for Janet. She and Kai were never together. So quit sticking your nose into our business. Emma couldn't utter a word. For the first time, she seemed so vulnerable, then rushed away in tears. Look what you did, brother. Playing with both Emma's and Janet's hearts is a low blow. You're one to talk. Wasn't the thing with Tina your low blow? Tina? Tina who? Tina was your crush. I had nothing to do with her. It's about time you get over that. That's not what Tina said. She told me you flirted with her, and you abandoned her when she's falling for you. She lied, okay? She wanted to use you against me, and never once reciprocated her obsessive behaviors. I just want to leave everything behind and enjoy my life here, with her. So Aiden, please, just let us be. Too bad. She seems to like me instead. <laughs> Can't you see? She doesn't care if her sister likes me. She still chose me over you. Dang, those words hit me hard. I didn't realize what I'd done to Emma all along. <sighs> it's time to end all these silly sibling conflicts. Guys, stop. Can't you see you're hurting each other just like Emma and I? Janet, this jerk plays with you and Emma. He deserved a fist or two. No, Kai. I'm not exactly innocent either. I was also using Aiden to get back at Emma. You what?
I know, I know. But all these petty revenge doesn't bring us any good. No one wins at all. And honestly, I regretted having hurt Emma. And so should you guys. <laughs> you want this golden boy to drop his sky-high ego? Yeah, good luck with that. I'm not a golden boy, Aiden. <laughs> Are you kidding me? With all your success and skiing trophies, mom and dad can even see me behind all that. When you left home, they freaked out and made me go looking for you. Do you know the reason I quit skiing and left home? Because mom and dad wouldn't stop pressuring me. It's suffocating. Every time I stand on the rink, my whole body shakes like crazy. I'm not perfect, Aiden. And I did not want to take away any attention from you. I'm sorry if you ever feel that way. Well, I didn't know. You could have told us what you'd gone through. To who? To mom and dad? The ones who keep pushing and nagging? Sorry I wasn't there for you. Heck, I was the worst. Right? You two could work this out. Now if you excuse me, I have my own sibling conflict to resolve. I was about to leave when we heard Emma screaming. Fire! Fire! Help! We immediately rushed to her, and the fire already caught on the haystack. It was spreading fast. I... I accidentally knocked over the oil lamp. What do we do now? You go call the firefighter. Aiden, you go get everyone here. Us two, we will go get water. Go, go, go! Kai and I tried our best to pour bucket after bucket of water, but it only stopped the fire from spreading, not put it out. We almost exhausted ourselves when the farmers arrived along with the firefighter. And luckily, after half an hour, everything was under control. Phew! But then, the farmers started surrounding me. It was because of you, isn't it? Every time incidents happen, you're always on the scene. Coincident? I think not. There we go again. But this time, I'm too beat up to even say anything. Then, there was Emma, petrified in fear, so I used every last effort to stand up. That's right, I knocked over the oil lamp and caused this fire. What are you doing? It's okay, I'm used to this. No, it was my fault. Janet's just trying to take the fall. In fact, this whole time, I was the one doing all the damage and blaming it on Janet. Was this for real? Emma's standing up for me? You? Is this some kind of childish joke? You could have really harmed everyone here. This is our life work, not your girls' playground. I, I'm truly sorry. That's it. Tomorrow morning, you'll have to leave here for good. Both of you. We had no choice but to call our parents to pick us up. Meanwhile, I gotta pack my stuff. Hey, I know I've been mean to you since forever, so why did you still take the blame for me? I'm just tired of petty fights. Besides, I feel bad for stealing Aiden away from you. I don't have any feelings for him, and I don't think he falls for me either. I just wanted to mess with you. I figured. Um, I actually heard what you guys were talking about before, and it hit me hard. You know, I used to enjoy being the only child. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, when you came, it felt like all the attention and love was stripped away from me. I felt so lonely and jealous, so I decided to make you the center of attention, but in the worst way possible. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's all in the past now. I just want us to get along. And me not be called a jinx anymore. You got it. The next morning, our parents arrived all angry. We were so ready for a long-term grounding. But once they saw us holding hands, they were pleased. Honey, I think your plan worked. I knew it. You two can be little troublemakers, but deep down, you still love each other. Come on, let's go home. Can we just wait for a few minutes? I don't want to leave without saying goodbye to Kai. But what took him so long? I gotta get going. Then Kai finally showed up. Wait up! I rushed out of the car and ran to give him a big hug. I thought you wouldn't come to say goodbye. How could I not? Especially when you forget the most important thing. Really? What is it? It's me, you silly. Oh, you're coming back to the city? Yes, I have a reason to be back now. To the city, to skiing, and what is it? It's you. Suddenly, a tree fell over right beside us and crashed the mailbox, causing all of the mail to fly out. <laughs> you really are bad luck, aren't you? Hey, that tree was already rotten. And don't you think that it barely missing us means I'm good luck? I'm just kidding. Hey, I'm Lydia. It might seem like this enchanting forest is real, but it's even better. It's VR, and you're looking at its creator. This is nature at its most perfect form, unpolluted, a home to many wild creatures. Those are actually my friend's avatars. One of them is Layla, my best friend, my only real life friend. All the kids used to think I was a freak for my obsession with plants and nature. 
Then I met Layla, who was also a nature geek in the neighborhood. I knew right away that she and I were going to be best of friends. We loved all the same weird things, like pickled garlic and growing peppers to make pepper spray. We were basically inseparable, and with Layla by my side, I couldn't care less about what the other kids said anymore. But my world suddenly turned upside down when Layla graduated high school and had to move out for college. Saying goodbye filled me with sadness and fear. Layla was my only friend, and I would feel lost without her. So she came up with the idea of using VR to keep me company. Little did I know, it completely changed my life. VR opened a whole new world for me, giving me the tools to build the land of my dreams, a place where Layla and I could hang out and explore nature the way we used to. Soon enough, I quickly got a grasp on VR and became a big name player in the game. Before long, my life was more virtual than reality. Suddenly, everything was black. I took off the VR headset and mom and dad were standing at the door. Why are you still here? It's the middle of the school day, for God's sake. You've had your head buried in that game since your junior year. Enough is enough. You know what? We've been too easy on her. You need to get into a college at the end of the school year, or we will kick you out of this house. Then how am I supposed to play VR? You know it's my life. Not my problem. You're 18. It's time for you to grow up and face reality. Mom! I'm with your dad on this. Now hurry up and get to school. Later, I reached out to Layla for help. Why don't you apply to my college? Huh, that seems like a good idea. I'd get to see you in person again, right? You'll be out of your parents' reach, and it's an easy school to get into. They just need your high school transcript. Simple. Girl, say no more. Sign me in. Months passed, and it was finally college admission day. Man, it is packed here. Where could I find the school garden? There it is. But where's Layla? There was only a boy sitting here reading a book. He was literally glowing in the sunshine. He suddenly looked up and our eyes met. Ah, oh, that was so awkward. Lydia! Oh my god, I'm so glad you're here! Finally, we've reunited after two years! Layla, I missed you too! I- Oh, you look different? The girl standing in front of me was totally dolled up from top to toes. What happened to her? Oh, you know, I found my style ever since I got here. Don't worry, I'll help you out with your style too. But I like my style. Anyway, do you know what major you're in? I haven't decided yet. Better hurry up, our school has a rule. To stay here, you have to choose a major within your first week. But no biggie, just go to my department, Greenhouse. I'm the class president now. Come on, I'll show you around. Then, Layla led me to her department infrastructure, and I was absolutely impressed. It was equipped with modern experiment and technology and exotic plants. Right then, a group of students swept past me and flocked around Layla. She introduced them as her new friends, but they just gave me the screening from head to toe, then straight up ignored me. Ugh. Rude? Whatever. I need some alone VR time anyway. I put on the headset and doing some boxing moves, but accidentally knocked over something in real life. Layla, why is your friend wearing the VR thing and breaking our stuff? Don't you dare tell me she's from VR. No, no, no. She just uses VR since she's socially anxious. I'll talk to her. Lydia, listen, if you're going to become a greenhouse major, you have to lay off the VR a little bit. You can't be carrying the headset around campus, okay? I confusedly nodded my head. Isn't she also playing VR with me all the time, though? Afterwards, I went to get settled into my dorm room to find a girl playing my fave VR motorcycle race while riding her hoverboard. She's good, but I'm the boss of this game. Instantly, I joined the race and quickly passed her. But man, this girl was fierce. We ended up reaching the finish line at the same time. Whoa, that was epic! I'm Lydia, by the way. It's my first day and I'm assigned to this room. You must be my roommate? Yep, I'm Christine, class president of the VR department. You seem to know VR really well. How long have you been playing? I'm kinda new. Just started two years ago. Sheesh, you've got games, girl. Wanna join our department? The next day, Christine showed me around the VR department, which was full of the newest techs. Dude, this is so sick! Every week, we have an exhibition of new VR technology, and we mainly work and interact in VR. No need for awkward real-life convo. Besides, our department also joined the school annual creativity competition for the huge prize of $10,000, which we could use to develop more modern VR technology. Whoa! This place was heaven! Just imagine playing VR all day, every day! Holy moly, can it be soccer shots enhanced? I joined in the game immediately and gave it a big kick, scoring a goal. Wait, did I break the pots again? I took off my headset to see a guy doubled over in pain. Oh god, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, I'm good, I'm fine. His face seemed awfully familiar. Oh, I remember you from the school garden the other day. Yeah, that was me. I'm Marshall, thinking about applying to VR? Yeah, I'm Lydia. Lydia, I think you'd like it here. 
I suddenly felt my face getting hot when I was saved by a phone call from Layla. I quickly excused myself and ran right into her. Hey, I've been looking everywhere for you. There's a welcome party tonight, and you're definitely going. N no, no party. Oh, come on. I'll introduce you to our research group. You've heard about the creativity competition for departments, right? Greenhouse is in it to win it. But no buts. Let's get ready. At the party, Layla dragged me to where the greenhouse kids were hanging out. They were still glaring at me. I should just leave, but on my way out, I bumped into Marshall. Hey, Lydia, I was looking for you. You dropped this handkerchief back at the VR department. It's from your grandma, right? Oh, my God, thank you. But how come you know it's my grandma's? Uh, um, I just guess. I, I saw your initials on it. Hey, back off, you VR freaks. Stop talking with our new member. Poof, are you sure? This morning, she seemed really fond of all our gizmos and gadgets. What are you talking about? Lydia, explain this. What's there to explain? Your pea brain can't read between the lines, huh? Layla lunged at Christine and a fist fight broke out between them. That's why I don't fit in in social gatherings. Hey, wanna get out of here? Yes, please. Marshall explained that there was beef between the VR and greenhouse departments. They were neck and neck for many things, especially the scholarship competition. But sometimes both went too far. The greenhouse put insects in the VR facility rooms, which chewed up all their cables. To get back at them, the VR messed with the water system in the greenhouse, which caused water blackout and killed dozens of plants. And naturally, the presidents, Layla and Christine, were always at each other's throats. Shoot, I was planning on choosing VR as my major, but that would mean turning myself into her enemy. What am I supposed to do? I tried turning back to VR to take my mind off things, but I could hardly concentrate. Lydia, why is your head stuck in the clouds? I've been thinking. I want to be in the VR department. Greenhouse is good, but I'm not sure it's for me. I just don't want us to be enemies. It's okay. We're still friends no matter what you decide. Just follow what feels good in your heart. Aw, she'd put me above all her rivalries? She hadn't changed so much after all. First thing the next morning, I went to apply to the VR department, then caught sight of Layla. Hey, Layla! I made my decision. I've applied for VR department. What? You can't be serious! Choosing VR would mean you're just throwing away your dream and living in an unreal fantasy. Unreal? It's more real than the cool girl with hot friends thing you've got going. And why would you tell me to follow my heart when you clearly didn't think I should? I, I told you that? I nodded my head, confused. I might have slipped my tongue or something. Just think about it again. Something was off. I swear she really seemed genuine yesterday. Over day, I got back to my dorm room only to find out my headset cracked and wouldn't turn on. Who did this? Freaked out, I only thought of one person who could help me fix it now. Marshall. It would take a few days to fix it. Oh no, I couldn't pass a day without VR. <laughs> I think you'll find something to do. Like what? You're more than welcome to hang here. Dang, this guy's cheeky. Suddenly, Marshall's phone rang, and he excused himself for a few minutes. I looked around his room and noticed two VR headsets on the table. Maybe Marshall wouldn't bother if I borrowed a spare set, right? As it turned on, my own forest appeared in front of me. Was he following me? I clicked on his profile to see. He was logged in as Layla. My friend Layla. So... The Layla I've been talking to was not the real Layla, but Marshall? How long had this been going on? And did Marshall know me from the beginning? Lydia? I took off the headset to see Marshall standing there, stunned. What's this? Explain to me now. It all started when I got my department's pricey drone stuck on the roof of the greenhouse building. Layla was up there, so I begged her to give it back to me. She only agreed under one condition, that I had to use her VR account to play with you, without telling you that. At first, I only did it as part of the deal, but after a while, I find her the funniest, smartest, and most creative girl, and I couldn't help but spending time with you. You're telling me that this whole year I've been talking to someone I thought was my best friend, but it was actually just some random guy, and you have the nerve to keep lying to me? Marshall, give me my VR, and stop hovering around Lydia or she's gonna find out. She already did. Lydia, I can explain. Was it because of the stupid rivalry between Greenhouse and VR? What's so important about it that you had to lie to your best friend? You've changed, Layla, and I don't think you're my friend anymore. I stormed off, fighting back tears. I couldn't look at either of them any longer. When I got back to my dorm, Christine was already there. I asked her about my VR headset. I actually saw that Layla around our room earlier. She must have done it. That was a low move, Layla. But I was too fed up with her to even be mad. The greenhouse department could be trying to sabotage us again. Now, this is war. I'm going to gather everyone so we can plan our counterattack. Whatever, this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway.
On my first VR free day, I was the only person in my class without their headset. Even the professors engaged through VR. All I could do was sit and stare at people, which reminded me of those lonely days before Layla came into my life. The next few days kept on repeating themselves, until one day, my body started boiling, and my head was buzzing like it was full of bees. Professor, I'm not feeling well. I need to go back to my dorm. But he didn't flinch one bit. No one did, except this guy. Hey, need an aspirin? He extended out his hand, but there was nothing there. A virtual pill? Seriously? No, it doesn't work. Aw, oh, man. Bummer. I tried getting up, but my body grew heavy and weak. I kept calling Christine across the room, but no use. If only Layla was here to help me right now. No, Lydia. You can do this on your own. I leaned on the wall to prop myself up slowly, made my way back to the dorm. I was so close, but my knees trembled and I collapsed. Just then, someone came to scoop me into their arms and picked me up. I woke up in a bad headache to see Marshall cooling it down with a damp towel. Hey, you're awake. Here, have some soup and take some medicine. What are you doing here? I came to return your VR but saw you collapsing, so then I helped you into bed. I know you don't want to talk to me right now, but this was urgent, so thank you, Marshall. I threw myself into his arms and burst into tears. I thought no one was going to help me. He wrapped his arms around me, and I finally felt safe. The next day, thanks to Marshall, I felt loads better, so I went to watch the department's creativity contest. The greenhouse presented their newly bred plant species and got the highest score so far. VR, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. Our newest development in headsets, uh, exploded. Christine didn't take it well. I tried to comfort her, but she just brushed me off and stormed away. Suddenly, Layla rushed towards me and pulled me into a corner. Lydia, I just want to say I'm sorry. Ever since I got here, I became the center of attention in the VR department. And I got so wrapped up in it. I had to give up playing VR with you. I don't know, Layla. Why couldn't you just tell me that? I didn't want you to be alone. You were always online, so I guess you didn't make any friends back home. That's true. This might sound ridiculous, but only now have I realized that VR isn't everything. No virtual reality can replace the real world. And real friendship goes through all kinds of ups and downs. But it lasts, just like you and I. I'm glad you realized that. And I just want to let you know, no matter what department you choose, I'll support you. Unconditionally. Thanks. But hey, why did you break my VR headset, though? Your VR? No, I didn't do it. I swear. Then how come Christine blamed it on you? I ran down to my dorm to confront Christine, but she wasn't there, and she didn't return for the rest of the night. When I got to class the next day, I put on my headset and found the rest of the department ragging on me, calling me a liar and a traitor. Somehow, pictures of me and Layla talking yesterday were plastered all over the virtual world. The audacity of you to come back here. We already know the greenhouse department is using you to spy on us. It was you who messed with our invention at the department contest. Otherwise, how could it explode? They started booing and surrounding me, so I ran for my life. Until a hand grabbed mine. You could run for real, you know. Ah, uh, yes. At least I'm not the only one virtually running. We made it to the building's entrance, just as the greenhouse student dragging Christine towards us. And the VR students caught up with us. Layla, what's going on? We caught this girl starting a fire in our greenhouse lab with her hoverboard, then tried to flee the scene. What? Why would you do that? It's not on purpose, okay? Then tell us the truth. Now, fine. So a day before the department's competition, I secretly made an adjustment to the VR model, but somehow it caused an error and we ended up losing the prize. I was so mad that I decided to take it out on this greenhouse bunch. Last night, I snuck into your lab, trying to take away all of your research. But suddenly, my hoverboard overheated and exploded, causing a fire to spread everywhere. I freaked out and left. You know the rest? Yeah, thanks to you, our lab was burnt to the ground. You're lucky no one got hurt. And you had the nerve to blame Lydia for losing the contest. I had to. Otherwise, the entire department is on to me. Oh, not just the VR department. Now everyone was furious at this crazy manipulative witch. What about my VR headset? Did you break it too? Well, that's just a little trick to get you and Layla to fight. You do belong to VR department after all. That means no making friends with Greenhouse. Right, guys? Guys? You've gone too far this time, Christine. And this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. Look where it got you. The VR students couldn't have agreed more. They immediately voted to impeach Christine from her class president role before turning her into the administration. They then apologized on Christine's behalf and offered to help the Greenhouse rebuild their lab. Of course, Layla and the Greenhouse department agreed. It looked like the start of a beautiful partnership. 
Within a few months, in collaboration with the VR department, the greenhouse was completely remodeled and renovated. No one even cared to mention the feud between the two departments anymore. And guess what? I applied for a second major in greenhouse. Double majoring was tough, but I had the support of Layla and Marshall and our friends in both departments. Speaking of Marshall, he wanted to take me somewhere special in the real world. He covered my eyes and led me there. Now you can look. I could have sworn I was in the VR world, but I wasn't. I could feel and smell the flowers, the soft grass, and Marshall's warm hand holding mine. Lydia, I've been wanting to tell you this for a long time. <clears throat> I don't want to be your virtual friend, or even a friend in real life. I wanted more, so would you like to be my girlfriend? Are you kidding me? Yes, yes, yes! <laughs> Ha ha ha.